Okay, can everyone see this? Okay. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar. Um, this is a Zoom webinar on Arang Osley health and well being. So, this is a webinar that brings together scholars from a variety of backgrounds to address current challenges for Arang Osley health and well being. We hope to foster informal and formal networks of discussion and collaboration for future basic and applied research. The ultimate goal is to improve Arang Osley health and well being outcomes. So, just real quick, uh, for those of you who are joining us uh, for the first time today, my name is Vivek Venkatraman. Um, I'm a biological anthropologist based in France, and I am one of the webinar co-organizers, along with Tom Kraft, who is also a biological anthropologist based at the University of California, Santa Barbara, as well as Rodney Obian, who is a college uh, archivist and associate professor at Keene State College. And we're very grateful to Keene State for hosting um, this meeting some of you have seen this, but just very briefly, we'll have a series of talks today and we'll have very brief question and answers right after each talk. And then following all the talks, we'll have a discussion session. So all of you will be um, muted during the talks and then unmuted during the Q&A, but please be sure that your own microphone is uh, muted. We do ask our speakers to uh, stick to your um, allocated uh, time limits. And when you go over, we'll uh, um, ring a bell. And you may feel free at any time to ask questions during the webinar and we'll save them and come back to them. And you can either type your question in at any time or you can use the raise hand function in Zoom. Okay, so at this time I'll stop sharing my screen and um, hand it over to Rodney Obian, who's going to give a brief introduction from Keene State. Oh, thank you, Vivek. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I think I'm awake. It's very early in the morning here in the US in New Hampshire. And I uh, just wanted to say on behalf of Keene State College and the Orang Asli Archive, uh, welcome. Uh, to the third session of the Orang Asli Health and Wellbeing Conference. Uh, my name again is Rodney Obian. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm the archivist at Keene State College, and I have the distinct privilege of curating the Orang Asli Archive uh, here in Keene, New Hampshire. Um, the, the collection itself was established in 2000 to document and share the history and culture of the Orang Asli. Uh, uh, some of you might have seen the photographs in the slideshow that was playing prior to the beginning of uh, the starting, and those come from our collections, uh, our collection, and from the papers of Adelaide Bear, Kurt and Karen Endicott, uh, Robert K. Denton, and Rosemary Giano. And I, I think Kurt and Rosemary are in the audience, so hello, thank you <laughs> uh, for sharing your collections with us. Um, all in all, um, the archives consist of over 20 linear meters of papers, publications, photographs, artifacts, and over 3,000 digital images and objects, uh, and dating from the 19th century to the present. Um, the archives is housed in the Mason Library at Keene State College, and in normal circumstances, it would be open to anyone who wants to see them, but, um, but most of our access now is online uh, at the moment. To, uh, so if you want to learn more about the collection, uh, we encourage you to visit us at library.keen.edu backslash archives, and I will post the web link on the chat box. Uh, so again, on behalf of Keene State College and the Orang Osley Archive, welcome, and I hope you enjoy the program. Okay, thank you, Rodney. So I'm going to share my screen again and just give a brief introduction to um, our speakers today. So today's theme is Orang Asli environments and health. Um, the major changes occurring in Malaysia today um, has been a big theme of the past uh, two sessions and is of course a, an ongoing and very important issue um, with the Orang Asli. And so today we have a 
variety of speakers from different disciplines to discuss uh, these issues. These range from uh, parasitologists, conservation biologists, um, to activists working in um, law and the media. So I will introduce now our first speaker, who is Dr. Yvonne Lim. Dr. Lim is a senior professor at the Department of Parasitology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, and a fellow at the Academy of Sciences Malaysia. She received her PhD from University Kabangsaan, Malaysia in 2000, and is currently the director of the International Relations Office at the University of Malaya. Her research focuses on host parasite interactions and the epidemiology and control of neglected tropical diseases, primarily among underserved and indigenous communities. Dr. Lim's work, which has been published in top tier journals such as Science, has garnered numerous awards and recognitions. In 2018, the journal Nature featured her as one of the 10 science stars of East Asia. And Dr. Lim is also a particip participating member and collaborator of the Orang Osley Health and Lifeways Project, which we have discussed um, in this webinar. So thank you, uh, Dr. Lim, for joining us. And you can go ahead and share your screen and begin when you're ready. Thank you very much, Vivek. Um, I'd like to thank the Keene State College for hosting this event and my special gratitude to Rodney, Vivek, um, Ian, and also Tom, and I'm looking forward to our collaboration. So good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Um, it's really my pleasure to be here today and uh, to be sharing with you part of our work. Okay. Could you see the screen? Um, yeah, if you put it into presenter mode now, uh, yep. we can have the full screen. Okay. So today I'll be talking about the tropical diseases among the indigenous communities of Peninsular Malaysia. Um, why is tropical diseases important? Now, as we know, it covers the tropical infections in tropics. And these infections, they flourish in a humid as well as hot environment. Um, unfortunately, it's very prevalent among the financially uh, poor resource areas in the tropics. And as we know, with global warming, um, the tropical region will be expanding to the higher altitudes. And this will definitely escalate the transmission of tropical diseases into uncharted regions. So that will then allow or give the opportunity for pathogen to spill over genetic diversification and adaptation. So hence, it's very important for us to understand these diseases, especially among the vulnerable, as well as the underserved communities in the tropics, such as the Orang Asli. Now, I'd like to, oops, I think it's, Vivek, I'll just move in again. Yep. Okay. okay. I think it's stuck. Is your screen frozen or? Yeah. Just hold on. I'll just move it to another slide. Okay. So as we know, the Orang Asli uh, comprises of uh, three broad ethnic groups, the Sanoi, uh, Aboriginal Malay, or Proto-Malay we call and Negrito. Now, what's important in the slide that I'm going to show you, I know all of you know about this, is the diversity of the Orang Asli. Hence, I think when we are uh, understanding the disease among the Orang Asli, it's important to know these nuances and it's important to know the differences. So as we can see in this map, the distribution of this orang asli is um, you know, right from the north to the south of the peninsula of Malaysia. Uh, for those of you who may not uh, be from Malaysia, um, we have uh, two parts to Malaysia. We have the peninsula Malaysia as well as the Borneo Malaysia, which is Sabah and Sarawak. So the orang asli are mainly in the uh, peninsula of Malaysia and the aborigines or the indigenous people of Sabah and Sarawak are considered, uh, they consider themselves as the pre-Bumi. 
So um, we will be focusing on this part of Malaysia. Now I'll start off with uh, a tropical disease which is relevant to worms or the worm infections. Now, those, so these are some of the pictures of the worms that we can see in the intestine of infected uh, people. Um, predominantly, there are four types of worms that you can get. The round worm, this is the round worm that you can get in the small intestines. Uh, this is what we call as the whip worm or Trichuris trichura. Uh, they are mainly in the large intestines. Um, so uh, when a person, they are infected with these uh, worms, they excrete eggs, which can be found in their feces. So um, how do humans get this infection? So some of these worms are transmitted via the fecal oral route. So it's if their food are contaminated or water or hands, um, and when they ingest or use their dirty hands to, to eat, uh, that's how they introduce themselves with this infection. There are some infections that uh, penetrate through our skin. So hence, if, uh, especially if you're not wearing shoes or you're, you're walking barefooted on a moist soil, this is a great opportunity for some worms to penetrate through your skin. Now, over the years, what we have done is just look at the available information uh, pertaining to worm infections among the Orang Asli in Peninsular Malaysia. And as we can see, the uh, red line here indicates the 50% prevalence, meaning to say that if, um, if, if let's say we, we take this, 98.4%, uh, so out of 100 people, 98 to 99 people are basically infected. So as you can see, um, the infection rates are really hovering uh, basically above 50%, even post 2000. So um, we were interested to see why this was happening. And um, one of the studies that we initiated was to understand whether, you know, um, uh, there was differences in the prevalence of these worm infections in the different subgroups. Now, I must thank Colin. Colin is our next speaker. Um, he really sensitized in, in me and Romano. So Romano is my partner in crime in doing uh, studies in among the Orang Asli. Um, so he, he sensitized in us that, you know, uh, the Orang Asli is a very heterogeneous group and uh, homogeneity in terms of measures, control measures and preventive measures is something that really we need to avoid. But we need to have data, hard data to prove this. So we started this study and it was in collaboration with uh, the director then of JAKWA. Um, at that time, it was called by another name. It was the Department of Foreign Asli Affairs. Yeah, so it was in collaboration with them. Um, as you can see in this table, there are differences and there are some community whereby the infections are rather low. And when we look back at the data, not just from our study, but from st uh, studies from other groups as well, um, there are indications that, you know, it's not um, prevalence of worm infections is not the same throughout the different subgroups. So what this data is telling us is that it's so important to take take this into consideration because control and preventive measures must not be customized. Uh, I mean, must be customized, sorry, to a specific community. And um, we should not use this one size fits all kind of uh, measures uh, to, to bring down the worm infections. Now, so um, we, we did lots of study. That was just one study. And we have compiled this information and shared with uh, JAKWA, the Department of Orang Asli, as well as with the Indigenous uh, Health Unit in the Ministry of Health. So um, post 2012, yeah, post 2012, the uh, health aspects of the Orang Asli is, in, um, is being streamlined and the Ministry of Health is basically uh, providing the facilities and, and care to all Orang Asli. Before that, before 2012, it was under the purview of uh, Jaqua. So I think um, th they are getting the kind of services um, um, as any other Malaysians are having as well. But, th but that in itself has its own challenges as well. Maybe we can discuss it later. So um, 
now, based on this results, the Jaqua then took some initiative to reinitiate deworming programs in 2010. Uh, just to put things into perspective, uh, the deworming program was uh, stopped in 1983. And that was because uh, the national data of worm infections uh, was declining and, and um, and uh, they, they sort of have a nationwide, um, uh, cease the program nationwide. Now, worms infection is basically very easily to treat. And uh, we are very puzzled why this is still persisting, especially in the Orang Asli community. Now, we need to understand that in terms of worm infections, there are various risk factors. Poverty is one of them. Uh, the inadequate basic infrastructure, uh, low personal hygiene, and low literacy level. Now, uh, I must say the government, through some of their initiatives and programs, uh, have provided some facilities in terms of infrastructure, electricity, water supply. Uh, but uh, it has its own challenges in how sustainable, how, how these uh, facilities are being maintained in the respective community. Now, what I'd like to highlight next is how, how we can assist the Orang Asli community in terms of um, heightening the personal hygiene as well as improve the literacy, especially in health education. So I'd like to share with you another study of what we did uh, to see whether, you know, besides giving them the drug intervention, uh, whether health education could also help and if uh, how to make it effective. So this was a study that we initiated. Um, Ahmad was a student that was doing this study. So we came up with uh, this program called HELP. So it's quite ape, it's health education learning package. So we even created um, cartoon characters whereby the Orang Asli could identify themselves with. And um, these were the various means of delivery in terms of the messages that we have to, to help them um, to have knowledge about the worm infection and how to prevent themselves from getting this infection. So we, we came up with uh, comic books, we had uh, posters, give backs, cartoon video, songs. We actually used their, their sort of uh, cultural musical um, uh, instruments to, to come up with the, the music and the kind of sort of rhythm uh, they, that they normally use. We also have puppet drama and also drawing competition. What was very interesting was that the kids were really very intrigued by the puppet drama show. And what we did was to um, get their involvement. They actually did a role play. And, and through that, I think that message was really ingrained in them. Um, and, and they could really recall back even after the, the uh, research that we have done uh, to you know, uh, recall back what we have said and what were the messages, what were the, um, the do's and don'ts. And um, another aspect of this program was that uh, we have to enable them. I think sometimes um, it's really not enough to, to tell them the do's and don'ts. Um, understanding their poverty level we need to provide them the enablers as well. So in this project, we actually um, ask for funds so that we can purchase, um, you know, like slippers. So slippers were very important because some of the worm infection, as I mentioned earlier, it um, is in, they are introduced to humans via skin penetration. And we know that because of poverty, they may not have the means to purchase the slippers. So, so the, 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 the joke was that the slippers were so nice that they actually kept it as gifts. So we basically basically had to really encourage them to say, you use the slippers and if, if um, you know, if it's spoiled, we will give you another. So that, that kind of thing to encourage them, uh, give them the nail clippers, the soap, and of course the, the drug as well. Now, um, in this whole process, we had to empower the school teachers because um, the kids, uh, um, this, this was done partly as well in uh, one of the largest Orang Asli schools in Peninsula Malaysia. They have more than 600 pupils. And um, besides empowering the teachers, so the teachers actually uh, will allow them some time every morning to read their comic books, 
to uh, to sing the songs and have some activities uh, that are relevant to this project. Besides that, we also had our student champions for our help program. So empowering these uh, key stakeholders were very, very important. And um, we realized that, you know, when the kids go back to their homes, they also um, share that knowledge with their, their, fam their siblings, uh, their parents. So that's really um, uh, very uh, fulfilling. So, I mean, in terms of hard data, what, what we have here is that there was a significant re reduction in, in uh, comparing the communities that only had the treatment without the health program versus those that had both. And um, some of the important things that we, we learned from this uh, project was that um, it needs to be multi-pronged. Uh, when we are dealing with, um, you know, especially with worm infections uh, in the Orang Asli. And community involvement is very, very important because we need this to be sustainable, not ad hoc, not one off. And um, we need to empower these communities uh, with knowledge and also with skill sets so they can take ownership of their health problems and concerns. Um, what I wanted to share was that the Orang Asli children and youth are powerful health agents of change. And I think they are the ones that are carrying that message, um, you know, after, after, we have, uh, after we have completed the study. Now, I'd like to share with you as well, um, you know, so once we have this, uh, um, the, the problem that I encounter is that uh, we have very limited resources in doing this. So how to be effective in providing treatment and health education to the most needed communities at the right locations, because there's so many communities that are in need of assistance. So uh, one of the things that we did was that uh, no money, no honey. So therefore, we need to be very targeted. Now. We, we initiated another study utilizing the geographic information systems. So this is uh, one study that uh, Romano, my colleague, um, has done. And uh, what he did was to gather all the information that we have about worm infections. And uh, we used GIS to basically um, uh, um, create a map. And with this map, what we could do is that we can identify, if you could look at the map on the left hand side, the areas that are colored in chocolate will uh, denote the areas that we will need to treat them twice. And those in, in the lighter or orange color, would, uh, you'll need to then uh, treat them once. So if we could superimpose this with the locations where the um, subtribes are, these will be very powerful information, especially for government agencies that have the capacity to move to these areas to deliver the treatment. So um, GIS was not just powerful in terms of you know a, a visual mapping, but they also provided us the numbers to treat, and uh, these it's very important because it's part of uh, using this for planning so that we can save cost and time. So um, we have the data for the 78 districts in Peninsular Malaysia. So what we have done is that we have shared it also with the relevant agencies, with Ministry of Health and um, uh, Jaqua. Now, the next thing I'd like to touch on is about zoonotic infections among the uh, Orang Asli people. Now, to them, uh, the environment is very important and they live in harmony with the animals, yeah? not just um, pet animals, uh, domestic animals, as well as uh, animals that are found in the jungle. Now, um, one of our limitations when we were doing the study is that we're using a microscopy and microscopy could not decipher whether you know some of these infections were human origin or animal origin so what we did was to use uh, molecular techniques um, to unlock the secrets um, i'd like to highlight a few examples now one of the examples is about hookworm now these are names of human hookworms species yeah and uh, in this study what we found was that in the um, orang asli population we also found a selanicum and cyclostoma selanicum which is commonly found in dogs and cats so they, they uh, um, we, we couldn't uh, identify this via microscopy uh, 
uh, microscopy previously, but with molecular, uh, we have information that you know uh, confirms zoonotic infections, um, and even among the animals that were in the community, we found that there was Selenicum. These are all uh, zoonotic uh, animals, so definitely. It's, uh, the source would actually be from the animals around the community. Um, these are some of the genes that we have used to um, uh, sequence and analyze the presence of zoonotic infection. Now, the next uh, worm infection that I want to share with you is about Trichuris trichura. So this is a common human infection, and we have never found any other species in humans before. Um, but in this particular study that uh, Shikin, Shikin did, uh, we found that a very low percentage now of Trichuris valpis is, is being harbored by the Orang Asli community. And uh, in their animal um, that is living in these uh, villages, uh, the, the animals are also harboring the human uh, species of Trichuris. So they may be mechanical. Uh, because um, predominantly uh, Trichuris trichura is not known to cause infection in animals. Yeah. So again, these are some of the molecular phylogenetics analysis that we have done to sort of confirm the presence of animal-derived uh, Trichuris valpis and human-derived Trichuris valpis. Now, lastly, I want to share with you about malaria. Now, we know that malaria is based um, is caused by four human species: Falciparum, uh, Plasmodium falciparum, Vivax, Malaria, and Ovale. Now, in recent years, we also have zoonotic species such as Plasmodium nullosi, and this was uh, first highlighted by Baobi Singh, who's a Malaysian. And uh, since then, we found more and more. Uh, Plasmodium nullosi among humans. Now, besides that, we also have reports of uh, Simonolgi in Malaysia. So, uh, these are the kind of hosts, the macaques, that are harboring the semen malaria parasites, the Plasmodium cotnei, Simonogi, Fildii, Inui, and nullosi. So, Understanding that um, some of the orang Arctic communities are living in very close proximity um, in, in forested areas, we then screen uh, the indigenous population and some clinical samples as well. So um, these are the results that we got. Now I'm going to just uh, quickly skip this. These are some of the molecular uh, genes that we were using. Yeah, what was important is that we found that in certain communities, there are a mixture of human plasmodium as well as the um, macaque or the semen malaria, uh, malaria parasite. And in some of these, they are uh, newly found in Malaysia in humans. Yep. So we, we have sent this for publication. Now, um, so the key findings is that uh, they are harboring not just a human, but as well as the semen uh, plasmodium as well. And uh, using different gene sets, we can then fine tune some of the detection of some of these species as well. We also find Inui light and semen uh, semi ovali. Now, so it's very important that in understanding uh, the disease, we'll need to lose, uh, use very high tech um, uh, tools. Now, what is more important is that we need to really understand this interface of human, animals, and mosquito for malaria. But more importantly, that one health concept is so important. And I think after this, we will be talking about the environment that the Orang Asli are living in. Uh, that is a very important aspect that we need to consider when we talk about the well being of the Orang Asli. Now, um, I'd like to share very quickly before I end a comparative study of resettled and inland communities that we have done. And Asta was the student that was doing this. Now, um, as we know, um, the government has resettled 
um, the orang asli into what we call as the resettlement uh, plan schemes. And this is basically um, the intention is to provide them the basic facilities like housing, electricity, water supply, and um, with the hope that they will be have a closer contact with mainstream communities. Now, I'd like to share with you some of the findings of what we have done. Because um, so this sort of summarizes uh, some of the aspects that we were studying. So we were making a comparison with the inland as well as the resettled. Now they are of the Negrito tribe. Yeah? And uh, we found that in terms of infections, of a worm infection, there is greater intensity in those that are living in the resettled. There is also a more crucial uh, need in terms of looking at the undernutrition status of the orang asli in this resettled uh, schemes. Um, besides that, we also did the gut microbiota study and we found that there was lower diversity in the resettled communities and there are greater resistance to drug resistance, especially for abendazole. So these are very important findings because uh, what it tells us is that, again, uh, in terms of controlling and preventing certain diseases, different approaches needs to be um, needs to be uh, engaged, uh, needs to be used. And in this instance, when we talk about treatment, the resettled may need three dose regimes compared to the inland ones that only may need a single dose because they have not developed resistance yet to this treatment. And what was more important was to look into their nutritional interventions to provide supplementations to them. Now, I think there's also a need to revisit the effectiveness of the resettled program scheme. Now, um, so in a nutshell, I think multidisciplinary and integrated approaches are very, very crucial we were to ensure a sustainable well-being of the orang asli communities. So these aspects, I think this is a great platform. We are coming together from different expert uh, fields to look at how we can actually provide a better framework for the orang asli. So I'd like to thank all my collaborators, sponsors, as well as my students, and of course the orang asli. Uh, Lastly, I would just like to mention about the Center of Malaysian Indigenous Studies that some of us uh, today who are presenting are, are members of. Uh, this center is basically led by Dr. Wylin. She's at the center here. It was established in 2004 to co coordinate multidisciplinary research if, uh, affecting the Indigenous people. And this is the website. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Over to you, Vivek. Okay, thanks, Yvonne. That was fantastic. We do have time for one or two quick questions. So feel free to type in your question or to unmute yourself and um, go ahead and ask your question. Hi Yvonne, thank you very much for, for your presentation. It was it was very lucid and, and, and so so timely and so important. Um just just two questions I have. You know, the map you showed earlier about the intervention where it's so nicely done by this GIS and you could actually map those um, in dark brown and, and lighter colors. Is is there a time frame for these interventions? And, and how are you working with the Ministry of Health to actually affect this, this national intervention program? That's the first question I have. Um, the second one, if you don't mind, is when you actually showed us the different types of plasmodium and you talked about the simian, um, the, the um, primate transmission, was, was there any link uh, in terms of the severity of the malaria or the manifestations with the clustering of these various uh, Parasites in the same individual. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Maud. Um, very good question. So I'll I will start off with the GIS work. Definitely, mm. there is a time frame because that that particular map would not be applicable in you know for for long duration of time. So when we did that in uh, two thousand and uh, twelve thirteen, 
Mm -hmm. uh, immediately after we finished, we basically shared it with the relevant agencies, like I mentioned earlier. Um, I really do not know whether they have taken it up. Uh, my gut feeling is that they have not utilized it fully uh, as what the data, you know, it's very powerful. I, I told them that what, how it could be used, basically, if they would like to, to relook into utilizing it, we really need to reanalyze with uh, more updated information. Mm -hmm. And um, and every disease, like what we have done was for uh, the worm infections. So every disease actually needs to have a map. Uh, so, so what is important here, I think, is um, as researchers, even government agencies and all, we need to share data share information because for GIS, you need to have a good amount of information so that you can analyze them statistically and it will be more meaningful. Um, the other thing is that, you know, um, once this information is provided, um, it's, it's really our, at the end of the day, it's really our aim that, you know, somebody utilizes it because at the university, we can just do so much because of our research budget. Um, the implementation needs to be taken up by the government agencies um, and the health aspect of it is now under the Ministry of Health. So we really need to work hand in hand. Uh, of course, we can work together with Jakwa as well in terms of the logistics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so unfortunately, I, 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 I believe it's not been fully utilized, Maud. Yeah, so, so that's the setback. Yeah, but we have basically made presentations and all to them. Yeah. yeah. Efforts to do that, and it's, it's a good thing. Yes, yeah. yeah. Sorry, coming so, to the second question, was yeah. there any links with the malaria, the manifestations with the, the you know, the constellation or the, the combination of different parasites in the same person? Okay, so um, in terms of this uh, semen malaria, now all of them basically, they were asymptomatic. They, they were not, um, um, there was, you know, uh, they, they were not hospitalized. Okay. Uh, and, but these were also archived blood samples that we did. Yeah. Right. Uh, so um, the clinical samples, the clinical samples, yeah, they were basically diagnosed with um, Plasmodium nullosi infection. So okay. what, what they didn't know was that uh, the uh, person may also have co-infections mm -hmm. with other type of simian uh, malaria. Mm. Yeah, because um, as, as we know, especially in Sabah Sarawak, they have done the macaque, uh, they have screened the macaque and the macaque do have the, the species that I've mentioned. Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so um, I mean, at the moment, it's also because diagnostically um, at the hospitals, they are not looking out for simian malaria. Uh, besides Plasmodium nullosi, which is more well established. Yeah. Right. So there's so much, uh, I think there's lots more that needs to be understood in terms of um, this zoonotic infection mm -hmm. and also to see how they interplay because uh, we, um, in our particular study, we found that, um, especially in the community, those that had human will not have the semen and those who had semen malaria did not have the human. So that them, it's a certain kind of dominance here, which we uh, we have not understood fully yet, whether how infections of certain sources uh, may suppress, you know, infections of the other sources. So um, I think these are very interesting information. So we did it with Babi Singh. So the samples were basically analyzed by two labs. We, we, we did it blind. Yeah, mm -hmm. because it was a very new set of information that was coming out. So we, we had to be doubly sure. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, that's a fascinating discussion. Uh, we should probably move on to our next speaker uh, who I'll introduce now. So our next speaker is Colin Nicholas. Colin Nicholas is the director of the Center for Orang Osley Concerns based in Kuala Lumpur. The center was established in 1989 to advance the cause of the Orang Osley whether via the greater dissemination of Orang Asli news and views, assisting in court cases in involving uh, Orang Asli rights, or in developing arguments for lobbying and advocacy work. Dr. Nicholas received his PhD from the Institute of Advanced Studies, University of Malaya in 1999. And I think I speak for many people here 
when saying how much we all appreciate uh, Colin's advocacy work. And I think many of us here uh, know each other through Colin. So he's been uh, excellent at, at uh, connecting all of us from different disciplines. So Colin, welcome and feel free to share your screen and begin when you're ready. Yeah, thanks, uh, Vivek, and thanks to Tom and uh, Rodney for organizing this. Um, uh, as usual, my talk has got something has got something to do with health. I mean, with land. So I'll go straight to it. I must add that uh, the issues, the more academic, the more serious stuff, has been discussed in the in the book a long time ago, on an article which D. Bear and myself wrote on healthcare for the orang asli, the consequences of paternalism and colonialism. So if you want the more the more serious stuff. About the history of healthcare in Malaysia, um, going back and so on, go to this book. But I must acknowledge the the the, the what they call it, the contribution of Dibe, not just to the center, but also to me personally, because she was the one who you know got me into thinking more about health issues. She's this was about 10, 15 years ago. I just had a call with her this morning, and she's not doing, she's not too good. She's in the, uh, no, quite aged and uh, cannot see. So uh, this talk is dedicated to her. Um, as you know, um, land is also, is of course, very important. But the important thing to understand is that Orang Asli is not just, uh, what do you call it, um, attached to land. Orang Asli are not attached to land, just per se. Orang Asli are attached to the customary land, the specific ecological space, the specific, uh, specific uh, ecological niche or geographical space, which they call the Tanah Adat, Tanah Lengkrik, Saka, Tanah Saka, and so on. So every Orang Asli community is attached to that particular land because, as you know, it is in that particular ecological niche which they get their history acted out, where their history is acted out, where their culture is deprived from, derived from, where their bones of their ancestors lie, where, the, where it is also the schoolhouse of their children. It is the source of their physical sustenance, the reason for their autonomy, and the reason for their health and well-being, and more, and, that, and more. And that is why if we obviously hear the term land is life. It's something we don't really understand, but I hope after this, you we'll, we'll appreciate the fact that for the Orang Asli and all Indian peoples, land is really life. So um, what do you call it? Um, as you know, uh, we had many issues with, uh, with Orang Asli defending the lands and, you know, and, and destruction of the environments and non-recognition of the rights. This case in Kampung Chunix, for example, a very direct case, no? Let's give you an example. This is a very beautiful spot in uh, Kampung Chunix in, in Greek, uh, Perak. And uh, after the logging, this is what happens, you know? So you can imagine the immediate effect on the, on the people's lives and the mental stress that they have to go through. And during the COVID uh, movement control order, the COVID response was quite immediate in many Orang Asli uh, villages. Before the before the Jaqua, you know, Julie from Jaqua came up with the order to ban outsiders from entering Orang Asli villages, many Orang Asli took it among themselves to, to barricade their areas or block or keep people out. You know? These are all photos from the Orang Asli themselves sent, sent to us. And we also had the donation drive to collect funds because in the first two weeks, first few weeks of the uh, movement control order, the lockdown, uh, many were caught off guard and didn't have the funds. So working to with uh, Rally International, Kuala Lumpur, with Impian Malaysia, we, we or rather they raised about 382,000 ringgit of which almost all was spent for 77,000 over families. And how do we do it? All over the country, okay? all over the peninsula. How do we do it? We work through the local coordinators. We didn't buy any food. We didn't send any food. We just, uh, our, our, our colleagues here, my colleagues here, uh, Dayung, Paisa Lily in particular, and Paisa and, and what's the name? Uh, Dayong's sister were very uh, instrumental in getting things organized. So the local coordinators got the money. They went out the next day. Tonight, we send the money. The next day, they go and buy the things from the local sundry shop, and they distribute it. We had 209 villages uh, served with 204 local coordinators. Co coordinators. So. Another thing which the Oranasli did and, and was commented on in the first seminar was that they fled into the forest. No, they didn't flee into the forest. They retreated into the forest 
uh, which something which was quite normal for them to do in their traditional lifestyle. So again, these are pictures from the Warnasi themselves about how during the first few weeks, they went back into the forest, those who had access to the forest, and basically had a good time, you know, and, and a healthy time, you know, and lots of food. So that was COVID uh, and COVID uh, process. And as far as I know, up to today, uh, three orang asli have come down with uh, orang asli uh, with uh, COVID, and all have recovered. No, but maybe Dr. Dr. Isandis who's here can give us an update. Now, uh, an important thing that happened to us, which which I I think is a good example of how land, the ownership of land, the control of land, you no, know, the recognition of the land rights is important for orang asli well-being and health, is the case of the Kuala Lumpur tragic deaths in May June last year. You no. Know? If you, if you recall, uh, in a very short span of time, 16 orang asli batiks, you know, sitting batiks died mysteriously. You know, the health minister, health ministry later attributed this to measles. You know? So, what do you call it? Um, this, for your, just for your information, this set of slides was also presented to the National Economic Action Council last year, headed by the Prime Minister Mahathir at the time. Uh, it was presented by Tony and myself, you no, know, to the for the, to the council among other things which. We had to talk about orang asli. So in the Kolako case, if you know, and Kirk is very familiar with this, uh, before 2009, the forest was intact. The, they had access to the very rich resource base, base, and the people were physically and emotionally healthy. 2009, no, uh, this was before 2009, from 2011 to 2009, these pictures. No? Then in about 2010, government came in with some project asking them to move to the present Kolako site and introduce a uh, brick houses, a water project, and even broad access, no? And all these things were just said, you know, delivered, no, or done, no? Even though the water system didn't really work soon after. But the more important thing is that uh, even before the 80s, and especially after the 80s, the, the areas surrounding their, uh, their villages, their, their area, their, their customary lands, were opened up for felda agriculture, mainly oil palm, huge areas. And then in, in 2010, logging came in and, and the plantations literally came to their doorstep, literally came to their doorstep, no? And Jaqua applied for 600 acres for the for, for settlement there, but only 14 acres were granted. Then the, the, the floods of uh, 2014, December 2014 and early 2015 was quite devastating. Even though the houses was, were on a high hill, the water reached, uh, reached them, no? And there was uh, at the same time water uh, mining and pollution uh, mining uh, iron mine and mangan manganese mine uh, was opened up above their village, making the water very unsafe. In fact, there were three independent water tests done, and they found that the water to be unsafe for drinking and very in a very high level of nitrogen and phosphate. So, uh, Dr. Chow is here. He can talk about it more. His team went, uh, the private medical medical practitioners, his team went to that visit, that village one week, one month before the, the deaths happened. And they did not detect any, any what do you call it, um, measles or whatever. No? There were some signs of neuro, neuro, neurological uh, disorders, uh, but uh, no measles definitely. <clears throat> but the official, uh, so, uh, what do you call it, cause of deaths is measles. And the government of Kelantan refused to conduct an inquest into the deaths of the orang asli there. Even though we had two other cases, the Teo Biam Hop case you know, and uh, the Adib case, a single individual died and rightfully they had a royal commission of inquiry into their deaths. Here, 16 orang asli died in a very uh, unknown situation and no need at all, not for a royal commission of inquiry, but not even for an inquest. So our, uh, our Contention is that the Batik ter territories were allowed to be logged, converted to plantations, and allowed, allowed to be mined. This is a direct recognition uh, consequence of the non recognition of their rights to customary lands. Infrastructure projects such as the PPRT houses, the water, uh, water system, and the toilets were introduced but fell into disrepair or were non functioning soon after. And despite having road access to the settlement, then healthcare was almost absent and none of the children were schooling. The loss of their resource base meant that they were not able to get their daily calorific needs, which led to the low body resistance, which in turn allowed preventable conditions that resulted in the tragic deaths. Nobody in this time, in this age in Malaysia, should be dying of measles, that's for sure. So 
the, cl the Colaco case is the classic example of what can happen if orang asli development and advancement is not looked into in a rights-based holistic manner. Development, development must not be seen in the, just in the context of physical structures or infrastructure projects, but must include recognition and protection of customary lands and of cultures. Now, what about development? The government has been developing the Orang Asli for the last four or five decades, especially the last three decades through the recruitment schemes, no? Re uh, resettlement and recruitment schemes. This is the, uh, the RPS dollar in Greek after 35, 35 years of development. And, uh, and what do you call it? Um, we contend that the, the agricultural projects by the government actually are aimed at keeping Orang Asli in poverty because I'll tell you why. Um, I'll skip all this, but uh, the, if you look at the results, um, in Pahang last year, in many of the big recruitment schemes, the income, the monthly income for the Orang Asli was 200 to 600 ringgit a month. 200 to 600 ringgit a month, way below the poverty line. In some, some, resettlement, uh, some resettlement schemes like Batau, the Orang Asli did not get anything for six months. There was a big huha uh, over it last year, no? But in contrast, uh, the Jakun Orang Asli, for example, in Bekok, and this information came from Dola Teko, Tekoi, where they, were man they managed to get back the control of the uh, management of their ladangs, uh, the uh, schemes, agricultural schemes, those who work their own farms, six acres each, are able to earn at the same time 1,200 to 2,800 ringgit a month, compared to 200 to 800 ringgit a month in the government schemes, which is all contracted out to somebody else. So there are structural problems there, you know? And uh, Orang Asli have been asking for this uh, control over the land, control over the agriculture to be given back to them. And infrastructure also is like, it's, it's a common thing. This particular village, Sungai Papan, the water filtration system costing millions using solar power was used was, developed, was built in 2011 from day one until today it's never functioned and we have a resettlement scheme for example in Kajar the Jahai is there right in Royal Bloom nice houses but no water no electricity you know and and, and in Dalu people still have to go to the rivers to collect to get their daily needs for water and in Batau one of the first uh, uh, model re recruitment schemes, uh, villages, the, the infrastructure there is still not adequate for everyone. So this is villages from Batau going to collect water from a broken pipe. So uh, for this reason, many Orang Asli do not want to go back to the original areas like this Kampung Sarok in, uh, also in Dalu. They've gone back to, and open up their own traditional lands, open up their, uh, the forest and rebuild their traditional uh, villages like Kampung Chinex here. And, and if you look at them in Tabung, Kampung, this Tabung Tabung, during COVID-19, during the MCO, they went into the forest and remained there and it's going to become a permanent settlement. Okay, uh, great. So the, the, there was a trend of going back to the roots for, the, for, for many people during the, the, the last few months. And there's a story there, if you care to look at it on Google Earth Voyager, you can get a story you know, of the whole resettlement, why they are going back and how they're going back and what they're doing to, to enable themselves to enjoy that autonomy which they have lost in the recruitment schemes. Now, can things change? You ask me, you know, can things change? Um, we've been involved, when I say we, it means our, our center together with Impian Malaysia, together with Mike Kase, with the funding from HSBC and Linaco and a host of other people with, with, with uh, colleagues like Zining and Yen and and Kalai and so on, plus the, the people I mentioned just now, they've been involved in economic livelihoods and in other projects, no? For example, this is Encik Awang Samai from Pahang. He's a very successful uh, club breeder, agriculture, durian farmer and everything else. So we, we were able to send some Orang Asli uh, to there for training on how to build fish ponds and, and, and uh, breed kla. Kla is very expensive fish, five to 600 ringgit a kilo, but they are not selling the fish, they're selling the fry. So when, when this village for example came back, immediately they started working on it by their own resources, building the ponds and so on, you know. But of course the elephants came in and messed up the ponds. So now they are working on building up the fence and so on. That's these are some of the life view projects which are Orang Asli are doing on their own, you no, know? and with them in charge. Then of course there's the we started off with the learning programs, the community learning centers, Nenita and so on, where Orang Asli teachers from their own villages were were trained to become uh, 
community learning centers teachers and and what they call it education and daily food um, morning meals were given to them no so teachers were trained by the orang asli themselves and all all of them are orang asli you know and that's very good and of course there's economic projects also like uh, live view projects like uh, uh, composting doing compost and uh, what they call it uh, growing uh, vegetables and so on but but that's that's uh, that's not what this talks about no it talks about health so uh, we we got involved i got personally involved because uh, palm here he's a, he was one of the staunch uh, defenders of this land and uh, during the log, blogging logging uh, logging issue last year blockades he was the head of the blockades but he didn't have time for his children no so much so that his son died uh, during the process and we thought that was not that was unfortunate and not necessary <laughs> Another case was uh, a two-year goal of um, this daughter, Jessica. Uh, she had fever and, and uh, the orang asli didn't want to send her to hospital because of their relationship with the hospital and their attitudes and so on. They sent them to private clinics, but it didn't work out. Eventually, she died. So, so uh, Zin Ling in particular um, made a chronology of all the events, all the death illnesses happening in that area last year. And we decided that uh, <coughs> Something need to be done. <clears throat> and with Dr. Izandis, no? Dr. Izandis, Dr. Izandis, this is Yining and this is Yen, and me is also here. Uh, we started a program on health you know, to not just educate orang on the health, but make them confident and be trusting of the health service, you no, know, because that was missing. And and there was a lot of exposure. One of the big uh, meetings, orang uh, Kombak Hospital had a big conference for, on Orang Asli Health. So we were able to bring a bunch of Orang Asli from, from the from Greek area to the, to the, to the hospital, uh, for the conference, and to participate, to, to get an understanding of what's, what's being done, what people are doing, and so on, give them more confidence. And then the next day in Gombak Hospital, where they again were introduced to activities in the hospital. And then later on, um, at the village level, they were more receptive to the, what do you call it? Uh, medical team coming into the village. This is the case study of Kampong Sungai Papan, okay, mainly. Um, and, this, and then uh, working with the health team in Greek, health department in Greek, a course on uh, orang asli, you know, health and so on was given. And, and not just did they learn about the importance of health, but again, trust building. Trust building was very, very important. So much so that uh, slowly they began to, what do you call it? Uh, Get confidence no, and trust. And this is Dr. Chow, and he has his team of uh, paramedics trained by the orang, trained by them for his people, the, the Federation of Malaysia Private Practitioners or, or Association. And following in the lines of Dr. Bolton, a very good example. And I think he will talk more about it next week when his, his time comes up. So at that time, there were a number of incidences in that from that village. Children were sick. Ordinarily, they would not have gone to hospital, but because of the connection. They trusted and they went, <coughs> and, uh, and nobody died. So more recently, uh, we worked with Gombak Hospital, you know, Zining and the team worked with Gombak Hospital to help. They wanted to go to the uh, far village, Kampong uh, Leaf, and uh, they needed four wheel drive. So our, we got our friends from the Land Rover Club of Malaysia to help transport equipment and food and so on for them. And a big convoy went in. No, uh, the, the the help team from Gombak was very good, very interactive, very uh, cordial with the villagers. They interacted well. They you know they got the trust of the people. They were humble, and I think that's the way it should go. This is the Gombak team from hospital going to Greek. Unfortunately, the department people from the Greek itself didn't want to stay with the Orang Asli. They camped some distance away, did all the cooking there and only came to the village to give them the food and do some tests and then went off. So, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a real contradiction, no? You got some good people who want to do something about health, yet the people who are there at the nearest, uh, you know, at the local level, who are the people whom they, the orang asli need to approach are not so receptive, no? So it was good working with the orang asli, with the orang asli hospital team in Gombak, and I think that's the way to go, no? Uh, because they have the expertise, we have something to offer, and 
and everything is for the good uh, of the Orang Asli. Now, uh, I said earlier that or the land uh, for the Orang Asli, the land is life. No? Now, this is a concept which is not very well taken up in Malaysia uh, because uh, we have tried, uh, Dr. Professor Goodyell and your guests have tried to bring it up in court that you know, land is life. Land, land is life for the Orang Asli. You, know? you take away the land, you're actually uh, you know, taking away their life as well. In New Zealand, they've gone a step beyond you know, and, and actually gave the, the Fang, Fangangui, Fang, Fang, whatever you pronounce it, river, treated the river, uh, gave, gave the river recognition as a legal person with rights. So the same rights you have, the rights to life, the rights to life, you know, to ink, whatever, you know, uh, freedom and so on, is given to that river. If that same concept is clearly understood, by our judges, for example, and by our, our, our public, for example, then we can understand why land is so important to the Orang Asli. Not just land, but customary land, no? It's so important to the Orang Asli. So, uh, Sandra, in the first uh, session of this webinar, mentioned that uh, something like, no, how the Orang Asli are perceived will lead to how they are treated or planned for. Very true. It is our perception of the Orang Asli that determines how we respond to them, how we provide help, how we treat them, how do we engage with them, and how we work with them. You know? And clearly, we need to change that perception that the Orang Asli are not you know, people to be poor, or who are poor, who need help, who need your, who are you know, on the welfare thing and so on. Because I still remember an Orang Asli telling me a long time ago that it is not in the nature of, of the Orang Asli to be poor and dependent. I mean, those remarks really, uh, stuck with me for all these years, no? So, um, we always say that, no, if you can't give them what they want, if you can't apply the principles of uh, free, prior, and informed consent, if you can't accept the right to self-determination, which is all under the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, then leave them alone. Leave them and their land alone. Leave it to the Orang Asli to develop and harvest their own fruits, no? That's what they always say. They don't want to, to to grow fruits, grow and you know, develop the land, only to be taken over by somebody else later. You know? So that's all. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Colin. That was great and really interesting to see these uh, photos um, of what's going on with the current situation. Uh, due to time constraints, let's move on. I'm sure there'll be many questions for uh, Colin a little later, but let's move on to our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Aya Kawai. Uh, she's an anthropologist and is currently an assistant professor at the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies. Based on her ethnographic fieldwork in Kelantan with the Batek, her research focuses on the social relationships of the Batek, examining how they organize and negotiate their social lives as their way of life is shifting due to environmental change. This includes research on navigation and the recognition and use of flora and fauna. And this topic, um, or rather this presentation will be very topical as she has lived among the Batek at Kuala Ko, where of course the tragedy occurred uh, last year. So her presentation is entitled Forest Life and Village Life of the Batek at Kuala Ko, Health and Sanitary Aspects. And um, I uh, sent a pre-recording, so I'm gonna share my screen now um, and put her video up, it's about 11 minutes long. Okay. Yeah, folks, you just make sure that you're muted, please. Okay. Uh, can everyone see this video? Yep. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start it. On this map, the big red square shows the location of Kuarako, and other red squares indicate the Ora Asli villages where the Kuarako people's relatives stay. During my first field work, I lived with A family from 2010 to January 2012, then moved to B family and lived with them until August 2012. The Batex of Kuarako used to forage in the middle and upper level in the 1970s when Kirk Endicott first did his research. 
However, since the 1980s, deforestation and oil palm plantation areas have expanded to upriver, and Campo Oran Sriquaraco was established in the mid 1990s. The Batex now use the most upstream regions for their daily lives. Today, I would like to show how those Batex live under environmental change and discuss their life change with reference to their health and sanitary aspect. The first and main sections are based on the data collected from 2010 to 2013, and the second section will show their contemporary life based on data from 2018 to 2020. This map shows the Kuraco area in the early 2010. There were three settlements or base camps in the area. Here is the place where the government settled Oranasli village, which they call Kuala Timor. In 2011, the government built eight concrete houses in the village. A family used this place as their settlement or base. Here is Kuala Balai, which is located about 30 minutes walk on the logging road from Kuala Timor. B family used this place as their settlement. The third is located upstream of the Badom. People here move downstream and upstream of Kuala Kasai. Those residential groups and locations change because of flooding, the change of residential environment, and so on. The way of life of the Batex of Karako had two main aspects, village or settlement life, and the other was forced life. After the rainy season and during the first season, they made family camping trips to the forest and enjoy fishing, eating fruit, and collecting forest products. When camping in the forest, they eat more natural food than staying in the settlement. They camp near rivers, using up river for drinking water and down river for washing clothes and the toilets. These are examples of their cash earning activities. They sell rattan, gaharu, and other natural resources to get money, and sometimes work for Malay or Chinese people. However, they do not like to make long-term employment contracts. As natural resources near the Kuala area have been reduced, males go on forced product collecting trips far away, and female relatives in the settlement help each other. While the males travel to gather natural products to sell, their families stay in the settlement. They purchase rice, sugar, and such like. They also obtain food by fishing, hunting, and gathering. Cell phones are used for calling traders, and motorbikes are used for traveling. The village is a hub of such cash-focused economic activity. And the population near the village increased during the rainy season because upriver people moved there to escape from flooding. So the village area is also a place to stay during the rainy season. Next, I would like to show where they move. The Batex live in a house which they call Hanya. However, the term Hanya is not equivalent to the word house in our society. These pictures show what they call Hanya. Hanya can be any house made of natural materials and plastic seats. They call the concrete houses Hanya but they also refer to each room as Hanya. What is interesting is that they refer to a closed mosquito net as Krambu using Malay. On the other hand, they sometimes call a hanging open mosquito net a Hanya. Those examples indicate that Hanya means a space for living in their social context. Their living space is always located near a water place, which is called Tom. Tom means water and a river. Rivers play essential roles in their life. They offer drinking water, a place for excretion, and a place for bathing. It is the center of their lives.
This slide shows camp locations of A family member and B family member. They camp in the places that are accessible to water. Basically, they use river names to indicate those locations. Circles show A family members camping, where the squares indicate B family members camping. Yellow colored markings are family camps, blue colored markings are husband camps, and a red colored markings indicates a wife's camping. We see husbands travel more often and further than their wives. If we compare to the 1970s that they traveled the middle to the upper level, their mobility has decreased, particularly women. Gender differences in mobility is more distinct for the younger males, especially if they have access to a car or a motorbike. This stands for their current life and the environmental change. This chart shows the details of the camps we saw on the previous slide. The purposes of these trips suggest that husbands' camps were created to collect forced products. I want to show how their lives have changed by focusing on the time spent on economic activities. I would like to use data from Kirk and Karen Endicott's book, The Headman Was a Woman, to compare with the clerical people's life in the period 2010 to 2012. The 1970s estimated time spent is calculated based on Kirk and Karen Endicott's book by Kuchikura Yukio as written on the slide. Regarding to the 2010 to 2012 time spent, I used the data that I collected by time allocation study during my first research period. I checked or interviewed people's activity about five to seven days each month, and I calculated its average. The average time spent by men on economic activity in a day in the 1970s is 247 minutes, and the time spent in the time period 2010 to 2013 is 238 minutes. This is almost the same as working 5.5 hours on a five-day working week. Details are as shown, and they spend more time on money earning activities now. The average amount of time that women spend on economic activity in a day in the 1970s is 175 minutes. And the time spent from 2010 to 2013 is 105 minutes. While time spent on cash earning activities for males has increased, that of females has decreased. However, this does not mean that females do not contribute to their economic lives. This chart shows female time spent on economic activity by residence and season. During the rainy season, it becomes difficult for the clerical people to travel far. So their cash income is scarce and protein from blow pipe hunting catches diminishes. This situation caused women to spend more time fishing and hunting for protein as a side dish. I think those sources are essential for children's nutrition. In the next section, I would like to mention their recent lives. The vertex of Karako have undergone those changes. This slide shows the disposition of government provided houses in the village in 2020. There are more concrete houses and wooden houses than before, and between those houses, the Batex built bamboo houses. Due to the plantation expansion, the families that used to live in Kuala Balai and other places near the village came to stay longer in the village. They use pipe water for drinking, cooking, and bathing. For the toilet, they use the small brook near the houses or use other streams when they go to the forest. This brook has little water during the dry season and the toilet style of the Kuarako is the wash, water wash style. When many people use the brook, it is unsanitary to use for the toilet. During my stay, I really did not like to use the brook, but there was no choice. 
Sometimes they bath in the streams in the plantation. It makes some people very itchy. The upriver groups are still based upstream of the Baton as their base. And this time, the Balai group moved back to the upriver near Kuala Balai, as staying in the village is not so comfortable. I would conclude by saying that Kuala people prefer to live in small populations rather than stay in one place with many people. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Aya. And Aya uh, joins us here on video. So maybe we can take um, one or two quick uh, questions for, oops, oh, sorry. Maybe we take one or two quick questions for Aya. So feel free to type it in or to um, unmute yourself and ask Aya a question. Top it. Yeah. Uh, Okay, the time allocation was very interesting and very well done. Uh, what were the women doing? You were saying they, they are less mobile. They are less mobile and they work less or, or what? Compared oh, to the you mean the ladies work less or not? Yeah, you, you were saying that they, they are, are less mobile than the men now. Yes, so, but it does not necessary to mean they work less because they do uh, how can I say some gathering near the village. But I during my uh, first uh, field work, many people were pregnant, so they do not like to move a lot. Okay, um, is there another quick question? No, okay, well, we can talk more about that later as well. Uh, thank you, Aya, very interesting work on the changes that the people at Qualico have seen. Uh, so we'll move on now to our next speaker, uh, Tequin Lim. Tequin Lim is the co-founder and technical director of Resource Stewardship Consultants a Malaysia-based natural resource consultancy company, as well as an adjunct lecturer in biodiversity conservation at the School of Environmental and Geographical Sciences at the University of Nottingham in Malaysia. Dr. Lim works on issues related to the conservation and management of tropical rainforests with a particular focus on human-elephant relations. And his talk is entitled, The Farmer with an Elephant Bride, Human-Elephant Relations in Peninsular Malaysia. Thank you, Tequin, and go ahead. Tekwin, are you there? Are you uh, unmuted? So we can't hear you uh, speaking, Tekwin, or at least I can't. Are other people having similar issues? Yeah, I'm trying yes. to this. Yes. Muted. Um, yeah, he's not, he's not muted. That's true. He's not muted. Uh, okay. All right. It should work now. Oh, okay. We can hear you now. Okay. Right. Thanks, okay. Man. Go for it. Yeah. I had plugged in my uh, earphones for some reason. I think I was looking for a microphone there. All right. Great. So let's get on with this. Thank you, Vivek. And thank you, Tom and Rodney. It's really a pleasure to be here and to share with you all. Uh, my topic for tonight is more or less building on what I did for my PhD of the last five years. I just finished it earlier this year. And it uh, was with the program of the University of Nottingham in Malaysia called MEME, which is uh, short for Management and Ecology of Malaysian Elephants. And the objective of this program is really focused towards the conservation of elephants 
But my topic, or the topic that was kind of assigned to me originally, was to look at human elephant conflict, which is one of the challenges for conservation of elephants in Malaysia. But I, I, I thought conflict was a kind of a, a negative topic. So I, I wanted to look at it a bit more broadly. So I suggested, and it was approved, that I would look at human elephant relations. And so that's the, the that's the, the slant or the angle, the broad kind of perspective that I'm going to uh, give the talk tonight. And the subtitle is The Farmer with an Elephant Bride. And of course, there's a story there, which I will tell you a bit later. Okay, so my, um, uh, as, as you explained, my perspective or my background is uh, from a forestry and forest ecology perspective. And so hopefully some of the angles that I'm, uh, I will address you know, the issue of orang asli health will uh, perhaps be new to some of your all right let's see if we can move on all right so the story of human elephant relations in southeast asia begins more than a million years ago with the arrival of homo erectus and at that time there were several species of elephants found in the forests of malaysia and the surrounding region including several which are now extinct um, in fact, just a few months ago, there was a new discovery of the fossil of the stegodon from Peninsula Malaysia. This is a tooth of a baby stegodon found, found in a cave in Pera. And in addition to Homo erectus, there were at least three other early hominins, Homo floresis, found in the island of Flores. And also there was one, I think this last year, found in the Philippines. And based on genetic studies, it seems that there was an early, another early human group, which uh, seems to have interbred with some of the Australian and Melanesian populations uh, known as the Denisovans or the Australodenisovans, although we have yet to actually find any, any fossils of that, uh, that species. Now, uh, the interesting thing about all of these species, and this one here, is that somehow or other, they went extinct. And that happened over uh, perhaps the last uh, 50,000 years, which seemed to be after the arrival of the first anatomically modern humans, the ancestors of the Orang Asli. Now, they arrived with these, uh, this technology. In fact, the bow and arrow is, uh, well, the, see, there are bows and arrows which are something like 70,000 years old from Africa. And so it's quite possible that they did bring this technology with them. And perhaps the humans contributed to the extinction of some of the uh, other species or the, uh, the early hominids. And um, for some reason, however, this species, the Elephus maximus, the, the species of elephant which is still found today, somehow it did not go extinct. And so we have been living, uh, modern humans and elephants have been living side by side in the peninsula for more than, well, since, since the humans arrived uh, 50,000 years ago. So the interesting question arises is how have we adapted to each other in terms of uh, being able to live side by side? And from the perspective of the meme program, of course, this is an important question because perhaps there are some lessons we can learn from archeology. span Perhaps there are some lessons we can learn from the Orang Asli today on how we can live together with wildlife in general or the natural world even broadly uh, in the future. So the, the question, however, is slightly complicated because the, hist the, the life in the peninsula, the ecology of the peninsula has actually been uh, changing a lot. Of course, it is it changed in, in modern times, but even over the last 10,000 years, since the end of the last ice age, there have been quite dramatic changes. You see on this map, here's the peninsula, here's Borneo. And over the 
much of the, during the Ice Ages, during the Pleistocene, most of the time, the Malaysia was actually connected. You could walk to Sabah and Sarawak from the peninsula. And in fact, this is what uh, seems to have happened, is that the early um, Homo sapiens, the anatomically modern humans, when they arrived in this part of the world, they, had, they were greeted with a, an open savanna kind of environment, a grassland, which they could uh, then uh, walk without too much impedance all the way down to Java. And similarly with, um, with elephants. The elephants, uh, in fact, have their teeth adapted for eating grasses. And so this uh, makes it even more um, uh, of a puzzle as to how both the humans and the elephants survived once the grasses, and this is, uh, this is uh, based on a paleontological study uh, from Thailand, the grasses retreated and the forest, uh, the rainforest, the closed, dense, tropical uh, uh, rainforest expanded. And so, uh, well, before the uh, deforestation of the last hundred years or so, most of the peninsula, of course, was covered with this tropical rainforest. And so, Somehow we have had to uh, not only live alongside elephants, but uh, eco living with other creatures inside the forest. And, the, the, and from the point of view of uh, uh, apex predators or in terms of biomass, uh, the absolute um, weight of the animal is the tiger that we have to somehow live alongside the tiger. And so there are two, there are two there are couple, well, the two questions there, both uh, are relevant to human health. One is how can we get enough food? And the other one is how can we survive with these uh, predators and also very dangerous uh, animals? And I'm uh, quite fortunate in that uh, the previous speakers, including Kirk Endicott and Jeffrey Benjamin and indeed Aya and Colin have kind of uh, given very detailed uh, studies uh, of the last uh, well, 30, 40 years of their work, uh, which has helped form a picture which makes it um, easy for us to see how humans, tigers and elephants partitioned the rainforest niche uh, among uh, the, well, these are, of course, this is a simplification, but these are the three main species. And in terms of uh, resource partitioning uh, between humans and tigers, this is in terms of protein, of course. What is interesting, and, and in fact, uh, I think Kirk wrote about this in, in the 70s, there was a question as to, why some groups of Bate, and in fact, many groups of Orang Asli did not hunt deer and bovids, and some even didn't hunt pigs. And this is similar in my research with, among some of the Bate. I was uh, amazed that they did not set traps for these uh, large uh, animals. And one, uh, well, the perspective of ecology, uh, as I have uh, uh, drawn out here, gives perhaps one clue in that humans could focus on animals in holes and animals up trees while leaving the ground megafauna, the big game animals on the forest floor for the tigers. And similarly, when it comes to the herbivory, and so we are faced with the potentially having to compete with elephants for plants in the forest. And so uh, that includes things like uh, fruit, particularly durian, I'll speak more about that later, uh, but also uh, other aspects of plants such as the leaves and the stems, grasses and plants in particular. And um, one interesting way in which we have been able to get food, and this has been well documented in, in in, in fact, in the 80s, there was this idea that perhaps the rainforest could be thought of as a green desert in terms of its carbohydrate scarcity. However, humans, uh, such as the Batek, did manage to get enough carbohydrate by uh, digging up tubers, uh, yams, for example, 
and from the forest floor. And then the question there is that, is that a niche, is that a resource that the, the elephants can't access? Well, elephants do occasionally uproot plants and, and uh, with their tusks and their feet, they can dig up tubers. But one aspect that the humans actually have an advantage over them is that there are some uh, tubers, um, some yams which are highly toxic and humans have uh, technology to treat them, to process them. I think uh, Kirk mentioned they sometimes get sick if they don't process them well enough, or uh, that's soaking them and cooking them. But yeah, this is one interesting area where uh, technology allows an advantage. Oh, I should mention that, of course, that the technology in terms of, especially in terms of the blowpipe, allows the humans over, uh, to have an edge over the tigers when it comes to getting animals in trees. And uh, well, Kirk and Jeffrey mentioned that this is not without cost because uh, it's dangerous to climb trees and you can fall out of the tree and die if you're not uh, um, fortunate. Um, okay, so one er thing that you can see from this table is that there is potential conflict here in that both the elephants, humans, and to a certain extent tigers go after the same fruit at the same time, especially, for example, during the fruiting season of durian. And that would uh, cause a certain amount of um, uh, competition. And uh, uh, one interesting thing I, I, I learned from uh, Kirk's study is that sometimes people climb up, the, well, the batek, uh, climb up the durian trees while the durian are still unripe. And, and harvest them while they are unripe. And so they don't have to compete with the elephants to catch them off the forest floor. But okay, um, there was about 5,000 years ago, a very important shift in this dynamics. And so far I've been talking about mostly about the Batek, who of course are foragers, the Samang or Negrito or Menra people. But when agriculture arrived and the Senoi started uh, planting grass uh, planting rice, which is a type of grass. Then there was, um, this was a recipe for, for com increased competition with the elephants. And sure enough, still today, uh, elephants come into conflict with people when uh, people try and plant things. In this case, this is Tamiya uh, in, uh, in Pera, and they have a banana grove, which was destroyed. And cassava in the background, which was uprooted, I think it's about a month before this picture. And you see, they've already started to replant them. But in response to that, the people have, um, uh, well, in response to the conflict, the Senoi occasionally will set traps to kill the individual elephant, and then they will sometimes eat it. And I, I would uh, point out that this is something that really is not done at all by the Batek, any of the origin communities such as the Jaha. It seems that it is the ones, uh, the, um, the Orangasli, who have, have made that transition to agriculture in terms of swiddening um, that resort to killing elephants. Oh, right. And um, another adaptation that doesn't involve killing is these kind of uh, tree houses, which uh, is found in most Orang Asli groups and even occasionally some other communities, especially during the fruiting season, they will uh, have these tree houses, which they will retreat to and maybe uh, come down and uh, catch uh, the durian after they've fallen, but before the elephants have a, time, have a chance to get them and then uh, climb back up. This, uh, these are both uh, from Salango uh, about 100 years ago, Skeet and Black, then uh, I mentioned them. Uh, this photo is from Skeet and Black. Right, yeah, and yeah, yeah, it's no, no coincidence that the, these uh, retreats are normally built beyond or just beyond the reach of elephants. And I think most Orang Asli uh, people who have been studying Orang Asli have found um, similar things. All right, I'm, I will end on uh, 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 this uh, kind of a fable of the farmer with the elephant bride, which comes from various sources. Sinehao mentioned it in uh, for the Chewong, 
as Bongso in Elephant's Land, but I've also uh, found similar stories from uh, Negri Simbilan uh, and also up um, in Southern Thailand, very, very similar story. And it goes something like this. Well, Bongso is a farmer and he, he, he comes across his banana crop, very much like the photo I showed you earlier and discovers that it's been trampled on by an elephant. So the next day he sets some cow crops, these spikes. And in, in the night when the elephant comes, the elephant actually steps on the spike and then uh, uh, runs off into the forest. But he, um, Bongso is not uh, um, uh, happy with that. And he, he chases after the elephant following the trail of blood. Eventually he comes to the land of the elephants and in this land of the elephant, what happened is actually he finds that the elephants remove their, their baju and they turn into a human. And he, he turns, it turns out that um, this uh, elephant that he was chasing was actually a beautiful princess. And she, he, he helped her remove this spike from his, uh, her leg and he ends up marrying her. And they're, 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 the story has various endings, one of which he brings uh, this, his, his new bride back to the land of humans. And um, she, unfortunately, she, she eats some uh, bamboo shoots and she turns back into an elephant and then runs off. But uh, one of the, uh, the offshoots of this story or the outcomes of the story is that uh, many of these Orang Asli groups have a taboo against uh, harming an elephant, hunting an elephant, or even eating an elephant. Uh, in the Chewong, it's called Kalaidan Gaja, but it's, it's uh, something which, from the perspective of reducing human elephant conflict in the long term, it seems that many of the Orang Asli groups have realized that coexistence is the best kind of model. And especially when you have these large dangerous creatures on your doorstep, you want to actually try and minimize conflict. You will try and avoid planting crops that uh, are too, too attractive to them. And um, uh, well, the, the lessons for, from this are quite clear in that if we are encouraging the Orang Asli to settle down, to move out of the forest and to plant uh, things like uh, that's my timer. <laughs> uh, plant things like uh, permanent crops, such as oil palms or, or rubber, then we have to certainly take into consideration that they will face these threats of elephants. And uh, if we are to live alongside elephants for the next 50,000 years in Malaysia, then it will certainly be worth uh, bearing all of these lessons from the Orang Asli into account. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot, Tequin. Really interesting stuff. Uh, we have time for one very quick question. If anyone has uh, uh, a question for Tequin, feel free to go for it. Okay, I'm sure we'll have some later. Um, okay, I'll introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Wang Pui Mei. Um, May has a master's degree. Uh, hello. Okay. <laughs> hi, does someone have a question? Uh, hi, so. Yep, go for it. Hi, you can go ahead and speak. I think, was that May maybe? No, it was, uh, I think, uh, it was Ita, Ita, but I think you might be I muted. Have, I have a question. So I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah, hi. So actually regarding to uh, uh, research, research that are done by Ms., uh, Mr. Tech Kwe Lim, so how your research to contribute, uh, especially to uh, reduce the conflict uh, elephant with the Orang Asli community. So because we see nowadays it's very difficult for them, even we see during the this COVID-19, uh, even a certain place where the Orang Asli cannot do the activity like planting because of the elephant always 
come and also disturb all their uh, plan. So maybe this research, uh, uh, your research can uh, suggest something uh, about the conflict between uh, uh, elephant with the Right, thanks Ita for that question. So I will give a very quick answer. Of, of course, uh, I would encourage you to look at some of the research that's been published by MIM for more details. The, my quick answer is that there is no one single solution, but that you need to look at the problem uh, uh, as a package and there are many tools that can be used to reduce conflict. One of the tools, is uh, translocation, which actually should be used as a last resort. But there are other tools where people and elephants can live in the same landscape if, for example, they build electric fences to protect crops during the vulnerable stage of the crops or, and also to protect the village itself. Thanks. OK, fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I'll introduce our next speaker, uh, Wang Pui Mei has a master's degree in conservation leadership from the University of Cambridge in the UK. In Malaysia, she has worked as a community liaison manager with the conservation organization RIMBA. And her current project, Project Takop, explores nature culture linkages and collaborative approaches to the conservation of biocultural diversity. And May also has experience working with the uh, Kuala Kobatek community. So welcome May, go ahead. Thanks, Vivek. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, is it showing? Right. Good. Yeah, looks good. Looks good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, thank you to the organizers. So I'm going to talk about conservation and um, Paranasi well-being. Um, so I'll have slide numbers on my slides. So if anyone has questions at the end and want to refer back to a certain slide, just take note of the number. Um, I hope to leave some time for discussion at the end because I have a lot of questions and maybe you guys can help me answer them. I'm relatively new to uh, working with Paranasi. Um, but it's, I guess, oral nasty issues have been on my mind for quite a while now because I started working in conservation in 2010 and in February 2010, this happened. Um, a tiger was wounded and, um, well, actually a tiger wounded an oral nasty first and then when he went to the hospital and he got injured and, you know, and this, there were a lot of questions in my mind and Rita, I don't know if you remember, but there was once during, I think one of the Eco Film Fest when we were at a wolf swatting flies. And then I asked you what you thought about this. And, and Rita's answer was something like, um, not all are actually hunt tigers. And um, well, anyway, she shared some useful insights with me and that's what this whole talk is. It's going to be a collection of conversations and experiences that I've had. And, I've not done structured research with Orana or even on my life. So this is going to be quite informal and with lots of anecdotes and lots of um, stories. So similar to how the Man the Hunter Symposium in 1966 was um, important for hunter-gatherer research, I guess the field of conservation biology really came together with this publication by the late Michael Soule in 1985, uh, where he outlined this new field that would focus on conservation. And right, right at the start, it was going to be a value-laden field, not, not the kind of science where you know, the scientist is an impartial observer because there was, a, there was a, a purpose to it, right? And he called it a crisis discipline and compared it to, say, cancer biology. And if you look at um, this circle on the right, so he included social science as one aspect of conservation biology being a multidisciplinary field. Um, but it, social science has always been seen like the, 
like a soft science, I guess, uh, that real scientists don't take seriously because of the lack of data, because it's qualitative, things like that. But things are changing. So I'm going to go um, back a bit further in the timeline and talk about the evolution of conservation practice in the peninsula uh, based on my experiences right here. And also, oh, sorry, I'm going to talk about it globally first and then relate it to Malaysia. So the kind of conservation as I've been working in this field, I guess I started being involved since 2008. And what I've observed, how we've been doing things, it's really something inherited from the colonial era. Uh, and back then, uh, in the 90s, you know, I guess you could you pick a point in time in Malaysia to be considered the time when Tamanagara was set up in the late 1930s, right? So the approach was something called fortress conservation, uh, where, you know, you fence up an area, you kick everybody out. And it was this idea that wilderness has to be pristine, that any kind of human interference disturbs it, destroys it, uh, affects the balance. But then globally, people realize that, you know, there's something wrong with this approach. You know, it's not fair. It creates a lot of inequality. A lot of people are suffering. Um, <laughs> in Africa, people who have been wiped off their ancestral land, you know, they are worse off. And then something emerged in the 1980s called community-based natural resource management, which led to a host of projects, big budgeted projects, called um, integrated conservation and development projects. And this, seek, this sought to um, improve community, to develop communities, and at the same time, um, do conservation, right? But then this didn't quite work out also, and it has been well documented in conservation literature on how these projects don't work and often fail. And so in the 1990s, um, mid to late 1990s, there were a number of um, thinkers who thought that, you know, maybe the people in the early days had it right on, or maybe we should go back to the barriers. You know, community-based natural resource management is not working. Um, even if people get richer, you know, wildlife will still be poorer off. Even if there's more money, it doesn't mean that they're going to stop poaching um, and things like that. But then in the mid-20s, a different kind of approach emerged, something called people-centered conservation, which is championed by the IUCN, among others, uh, and inclusive conservation which is, um, you can read more about it, at the ICCA Consortium website. And so the difference to me between what, what was done in the 1980s and what the new thinking that's, that's being done now is that in the 1980s, conservationists were trying to break this um, connection between people and your land, between indigenous people and and the surroundings, and with their culture, and all that. And that was why it wasn't working, because it was this top-down, externally imposed approach, which did not listen to the people. And the approach now um, that's being um, promoted internationally um, places a lot of the agency uh, decision making back into the hands of the people. And for Malaysia, so it was when I was doing my master's in the UK, when I had, a time, had some time to take a step back and you know, look at how we were doing things. And I was like, ha, huh? how come we are still stuck in fortress conservation? I mean, what, what happened? I mean, admittedly, our conservation leaders were conservation biologists, but um, but I mean, what happened in between 1930s until now? Uh, then I came back and I spoke to more people and then, then I realized, oh, okay, actually maybe we're at the back to the various um, point in time because there were people who have taken part in um, integrated conservation and development projects. Um, and there were people who had, had their hearts broken, you know, and, and 
Yeah, so maybe they were against, you know, putting, letting go, letting go, letting, letting people take control because they were afraid that things might happen. And personally, I think that one of the reasons why we haven't been as inclusive in conservation practice in Peninsula Malaysia, at least for, for tiger conservation, where the field where I work in, maybe we just didn't know how. You know, at the beginning of me exploring this topic, I didn't have the vocabulary to talk about these things. I, I didn't know what to do. And you know, most of us wanted to work in conservation because we wanted to escape people. And then suddenly you discover that, oh goodness, conservation is actually a social process. And, and it's, it's, it involves a lot of negotiation, um, a lot of trade-offs. Um, yeah, and so it's something that we have to learn to do. And also, I haven't met any social scientists um, in conservation practice. And so maybe that's why. Um, we have also been limited by funding restrictions. So for the past 15 months, my time has been supported by a very understanding donor. But throughout all the other the years that I've been working in conservation, we've always had donors who, let's say the projects were very KPI focused, you know, and, and working with communities, working with Orang Asli, there's, there's so many things you cannot control. There's so many elements that you just have to let go of and just go with the flow. And that doesn't gel well with conservation funding. And it's difficult mentally as well. And I've discovered that <laughs> scrubbing your toilet with a toothbrush is very therapeutic. And so another thing about working with communities is that, um, so I think for people who work in conservation, there, there are three things that we, that might keep us awake at night now. One is population growth, um, but in the world, but also, you know, when it comes to forest communities, you know, when there's population growth, you need more food, it's going to be more hunting, it's going to be more depletion of natural resources, that's true. But on the flip side, so I was talking to a lady in Kuala Ho. She already had I think five children, one of whom has been adopted by somebody else, and she's still quite young. And so when I asked her, do you want more kids? She was like, yeah, of course. And I was like, um, why? And then she said, because if people die, then we won't have a village anymore. Kita tak ada kampung dah. So that was quite um, sobering. Like they they know, I mean, Kurt mentioned in the first session that anyone at any age could die, you know, it's, it's a risk that everyone faces, no matter whether you're two years old or 20 years old. And sadly, that is still true today, which really shouldn't be the case. Um, the second thing that we're worried about is that we might do harm to a community, right? I mentioned um, the docu well-documented examples of failures on community-based natural resource management. When, you know, project funding, a huge influx of funding is injected in the community. It could lead to elite capture. It could lead to, you know, people who are a bit smarter, people who have more connections, people in positions of power capturing the resources, which could lead to inequality, greater inequality in a village. This could um, lead to a breakdown in social relations. Uh, it could lead to people having a sense of entitlement, yeah, so, you know, there's so many things that you cannot control and you worry, you know, if you do this, is it going to backfire on you? And another thing that we are worried about is, is this, you know, and this is a Salai, a Semai uh, student farm. And yeah, I mean, we, we all know the, the impacts of um, monoculture on forests and all that, but but to a conservationist, this is this is still quite distressing. But then we also have to recognize that, you know, um, us, you know, people who, who, who live this um, 
this modern lifestyle, um, this economic system that we're living in, the capitalist neoliberal um, economic system has taken away so much from Orang Asli. Um, yeah, so it's, I mean, at the same time, you know, who are we to go and tell them that they cannot clear the forest or they have to lie? So there's a lot of conflicting emotions <laughs> here, right? But I think at the core, in terms of our approach, um, one is we, we need to decolonize how we do things in conservation. Uh, and again, it was only when I was in the UK that I realized what an impact um, uh, the, the, the colonial days had, had is still having on us, right? Things like um, the idea that people are separate from nature, um, the myth of the lazy native, the idea that Orang Asli are simple people who need protection. In fact, the early Jaqua um, uh, staff, they were called protectors of the aborigine. And one that they, they were supposed to protect Orang Asli from Chinese people from, from cheating them, you know. Yeah. And, and all these ideas of, um, of race and stereotypes, a lot of it we inherited from the colonial era. And so we also need to think about how we do things in Malaysia, how, how we view people, and also to recognize that culture and nature are inseparable. So in the, in the sphere, sphere of um, cultural heritage conservation, like UNESCO heritage sites and all that, uh, they have reached the same kind of conclusions. Uh, and that's why the IUCN for nature and ICROM for cultural preservation are working together to promote you know, nature, culture, literature, and, and people-centered approaches, which is where I got the name of this talk from. And so to give a, oh gosh, five minutes left. Okay, a quick case study is what we're doing in uh, Kanye State Park now in Tengganu. Um, so this is Kanye State Park in pink. It's very, very new. It was created only in 2018 and 2019. Uh, even the regulations are not fully written yet. Uh, we have no management plan. And so that's what we're working on right now with the Tengganu State Park. Management Council, who are very, very supportive. And so we had, uh, so thankfully, COVID hasn't stopped everything here in Tengano, and in August, we managed to hold a management plan workshop. So we wanted to invite um, local community members, right? So these are the Malay villages, this is the Orang Asli, these are the Orang Asli villages, Koloko and Sungai Barua. Unfortunately, Sungai Barua declined to attend, uh, but Koloko people were like, oh yeah, sure, we'll come. And um, so it was held in Wisma Darul Iman, which is where the Tengganu and this office is. And we were up here on the 18th floor. Uh, it's quite fancy, everything. I was like, hmm. I didn't want them to feel intimidated because we wanted them to speak up, you know, to, to give their input to this, uh, this um, stakeholder consultation. So I picked up the button and the current treasurer, so Palako, they've set up a MPKK, a, what is this, Village Development Committee. So we, we got the chairperson and treasurer to come, brought them shopping. Uh, again, I was quite lucky that we had disposable, uh, we had uh, unrestricted funding, which allowed me to bring them shopping. And for the first time in my life, I could pick things off the rack without looking at them. And shiny shoes are very important <laughs> for confidence building, as it turned out. Um, yeah, and so we were in this room, you know, full of government, uh, civil servants, uh, academics, people in suits and all that. Um, and um, I think Batin Muhammad did really well. So, so I gave a short presentation on people-centered approaches and invited him to say a few words about um, the cultural values of the forest. And I think he managed to change a few perspectives in the audience, which was really important. We also had a wild card. So Dom was the one who introduced me to his Batik family. And Dom has known Golako people for over 10 years now. Um, 
and it was so useful to have him there because he could share um, a hotel room with the batik and could help them with things like, you know, pressing elevator buttons or making tea in the middle of the night, all these kind of things that, you know, you don't even think about when you think about, you know, engaging communities uh, in conservation. Um, so this is, yeah, I'm just going to skip past this because this is some theoretical concepts uh, that Colin spoke about, Yvonne spoke about, about like systems thinking is really important because you can't just look at health, you know, if you want to look at the consider the well-being of a community, even if the health authorities are brilliant and provide the best service, they'll, they'll only be treating the symptoms because the root causes could be environmental destruction or pollution. And I think starting to think about community resilience instead of development, development. I mean, what is development? We always think about development in terms of money, you know, uh, high income levels and all that. But that's not the only thing that, that's important for people, especially forest people, you know. Um, and this course, this was my COVID lockdown project. And highly recommend it. Um, it's, it talks about, um, it's multidisciplinary and talks about how humanity got to this point, why, how we ended up facing this multiple crisis of zoonotic diseases, um, climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, and talks about you know, what we can do about it by starting small, by building resilience in both rural and urban communities. Um, and this is another approach called the asset-based community development approach. Uh, and I really like this because it flips the narrative of rural people of Orang Asli being um, poor, simple-minded recipients of aid, but instead considers them as people with assets to contribute. Yeah, so this is assets mapping, right? So, so financial assets is just one part of it, you know? There's, and just because you're financially poor doesn't mean you don't have assets, doesn't mean you're not, I mean, it doesn't mean you're not at a good place, you're not living a good life. Um, and this framework, so conservationists outside Malaysia have been thinking for a number of years about um, how to engage communities in conservation. This is part of a toolkit that the Cambridge Conservation Initiative came up with. It's a toolkit on integrating rights and social issues in conservation. And I think this really, this takes into account systems thinking, uh, uh, resilience, science. Uh, I think it's, but one thing that's really important in Malaysia is to, I think religion has to be here also. Hmm, 20 minutes. Do, can I have five more minutes, Vivek? Uh, let's go with three and a half. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So last two things I wanted to talk about related to um, health is, is food and death. Um, both things that are very important to me. So so food, I mean, we've talked about um, lack of protein and all that. And, and that could be... Oh, and um, they know about chaching, Palako people, you know. So whatever... Hospital Gompa, the health authorities have been doing it's, it's working. Because right? they told me about judging. Um, so food, I mean it's it's so it's become so political because Palako people are now Muslim and, and they they keep being told well, both Palako and Sunai Baro. And they're told that you know you cannot eat this, you cannot eat that, and all that. So this this breaks off their ties with the tradition, with their culture. And then on the other hand, then there's, there's also market forces at play. Someone in Colaco told me that, um, oh yeah, we've hunted everything and now we don't have enough to eat. <laughs> so yeah, these are two things that needs, needs to be talked about. And an increase in money, I mean, if they have more cash, doesn't necessarily mean that they eat more healthily. I'll give you an example. So recently we hired um, some of them to do some work in the Kanye State Park. 
And then I sent them back to the village. Uh, and then that evening, we went out to Chiku to do some shopping and we bought cell phones, power banks, very important things. Um, and then on the way back, um, we stopped by a grocery store in Arin Sibulo. And then they bought uh, eggs, uh, ikan bilis, anchovies. And then we went back to the village. And then I realized that, oh my goodness, there were people in the village who were waiting for us to go back for food. Um, then, okay, then I just sat and watched. Um, and then they cook Maggie curry with egg, with ikan bilis, and then had that with rice. Um, so, I don't know, I, I, I try not to, because everyone already, everyone who goes in the village keeps telling them what to do, how to live, you know, what they can show, you know, so I try to reserve this comment sometimes, uh, but I, I don't know, should I say something? Should I? So they did want to buy chicken, but there's no chicken. But this grocery store is full of fresh veg and all that, but they only bought eggs and anchovies. Yeah, so that's, I, I don't know. Um, another thing is, is death. So, so they face death a lot. And in these two years that I've been um, learning from Polaco people, inevitably, well, I face death a lot too. And I don't deal with it very well. Um, but so for them, I don't know, there could be some psychological um, resilience, this ability to deal with death perhaps um, because they have never, I guess, enjoyed the benefits of, of modern living, I guess. Uh, this thing that we, a lot of us take for granted. And there are a few stories that I wanted to tell about running out of time. So never mind, I'll tell, I'll tell it another time. Stories about death. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, May, for that. Um, unfortunately, we do need to move on uh, to the next talk immediately since we're getting uh, on in time, but we can handle some questions uh, for you later. So moving on to the next talk, uh, we have uh, Jules Ong. He's a freelance filmmaker and journalist based in Kuala Lumpur with a special interest on issues affecting minorities and the environment. He tries to give a voice to the voiceless and the marginalized in society. His work has been featured on international news organizations, including Al Jazeera, and Jules has an academic background in anthropology, having earned a master's degree in social anthropology from SOAS University of London. Uh, his talk is entitled Arang Osley and the Media. Uh, thanks for being here, Jules. Are you ready? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Vivek, for having me. Um, okay. Yeah, I hope you all will keep awake. I'm the last speaker here. Um, my talk is going to be a bit different from the rest. Um, it's going to be about the media and my experience, as well as generally uh, how I observe uh, orang asli issues have been portrayed and covered, and uh, particularly in the Malaysian media. Um, uh, uh, Jules, was, you, uh, yeah. shares your screen. I, Did you share your screen? Yeah, I think. Yeah, hold on. Okay. Yeah, hold on. I think it's because my still uh, May is still sharing the screen. He cannot share. Uh, May, can you unshare your screen? There, it's, it's undone. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Jules. Okay. Uh, okay, I've just shared my screen. Can you see? Uh, not, no? not yet. Okay, wait, what do I do? That's top one. How about this? Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay, hold on, I'll just scroll up. Okay, um, um, the power of the media. I think we all know how powerful the media is in a way it shapes the way we perceive a certain group of people and no less about uh, marginalized groups uh, like the Orang Aslis. Uh, the power of the media, it uses the power of images and the language and uh, more often than not, it repeats and strengthens certain stereotypes uh, with regards to the Orang Aslis, uh, it underrepresents them and also misrepresents them. 
it portrays the Orang Asli as a monolithic group uh, without diversity. And it reiterates a lot of unchecked biases. Uh, these are some of the research that has been done about media uh, or Orang Asli in media. Uh, some of them I've picked up from uh, the language of, uh, sorry, the, Acad the Language Research Academy, UITM, very recent uh, research, 2019 as well as the USM uh, School of Language, Literacies and Translation in 2020 uh, studies on media representation, as well as um, a language that's being used uh, on Orang Aslis. So I'll just give some examples. Um, stereotypes on Orang Asli shapes a lot of the narrative uh, of Orang Aslis. And uh, as uh, Colin Nicholas' uh, presentation shows that how we perceive the Orang Asli, how Orang Aslis are treated uh, depends on how they're perceived. And more often than not, we see these stereotypes of Orang Aslis as being uneducated and hence they are in need of education, helpless. So they're in need of charity, childlike, primitive. So they're in need of protection from the government, uh, in need of modernization. They're emotional, cultural, in need of rationality. They don't have any religion. So they need to be safe. So there's a lot of uh, evangelizing of uh, Orang Aslis, but it's from the Christian missionaries or from the Islamic uh, institutions. And uh, the uh, marginalization of uh, Orang Aslis uh, is, uh, is also um, linked to the othering, the language of othering of the Orang Asli. So I'll just give an example here. I've picked up some uh, representations in the local media. This one is in the Sun Daily. Uh, it's from commentary. And Orang Asli are Malaysians too, right? They are so marginalized and their language are so othering that uh, we're not quite sure if they are part of us. Orang Asli are Malaysians too, right? And some of the images of, uh, that we see quite often with regards to Orang Asli is uh, they're in need of charity. So we have politicians going into the interiors, uh, giving bags of goods, uh, used clothes or uh, food. Uh, and uh, this is quite a common image uh, representation, a portrayal of Orang Aslis. Uh, this is another one also from uh, the star. Uh, poor and hungry, not able to sustain themselves. Pictures like this. in need of education, uh, they are uneducated. We, have, uh, we do not recognize the knowledge that they know. Uh, they are uneducated and they need to be educated. Primitive and shy, this is actually from the Guardian. Um, look at the photo that's been taken. It just shows our Asli as victims of circumstances uh, and that they have no agent, no agency to uh, change their uh, future, uh, and are just at the mercy of uh, circumstances and beneficiaries of the state. There's another picture in need of modernization. Um, governments like to build them uh, brick houses because uh, they are living in bamboo houses. Uh, therefore, they're in need of modernization. Another picture. One other picture that uh, portrays Orang Asli is uh, a lot linked to the culture, cultural performances. And this Mamere picture has uh, been used quite a bit to, as a represent, representation of Orang Asli in Malaysia. Cultural, exotic, nostalgic, lack of rationality and uh, needs protection. This one is from the Union of Catholic Catholic Asian News. Uh, again, the uh, portrayal of Orang Asli. 
represented by the mummery uh, in this uh, cultural costumes. In need of religion, here is a piece of a uh, news report of 44 Orang Asli in Perak embracing Islam in Astro Awani. So the narrative that Orang Asli in the media uh, by and large has been very disempowering. Uh, they are the victims of circumstances in need of help rather than the agents of change or problem solvers. Uh, but there are also uh, empowering pictures or images in the last few years. Uh, some of the examples of winning court case claiming native, native customary like land rights. Uh, in the last few years, blockades uh, by, by Tamias in Kelantan. Uh, and uh, also by artists and professionals. And uh, in terms of uh, intrusion and deforestation into the land, uh, in the last few years, there have been urbanized in solidarity with Orang Asi to protect the forest. So just show some example of a picture. This one is this year, Orang Asi wins long legal battle. Uh, but I also noticed that there are not many of such pictures, you know, and if they are, they have the lawyers with them a lot. This one was particularly interesting in the past few years where the Termias uh, start to uh, blockade against uh, deforestation loggers, durian plantations, palm oils of the native customary lands. And we can see more and more pictures of more uh, empowering pictures of uh, the Orang Aslis uh, struggling and fighting to protect the land. So this, this particular photo is very interesting. Uh, this is a Termia Orang Asli, and he is holding a video camera on the other side and filming the forestry officers trying to break down the blockade. I thought this is quite an empowering picture. Another photo out of that uh, uh, series of blockades. And this is a documentary I did three years ago, uh, Fighting for Our Home. I think it's uh, one of the few uh, videos or documentaries that shows them uh, struggling, fighting, uh, taking, uh, taking matters into their own hand to uh, defend their homeland. And uh, of late, in the past few years, we also see some Orang Asli artists, in particular Shak Koyo, who are uh, depicting um, portrayals of Orang Asli, uh, according to himself, themselves, you know. And for the first time, I think we're seeing uh, powerful images. This one is actually in the uh, center of Malaysian independence studies, a mural, large mural. Uh, and he paints uh, large murals of men, women, boys and girls, Orang Asli boys and girls. This one was in a school uh, of uh, students, two students of the school who, who were doing very well. And in the last couple of years, um, we also see a more positive portrayal of Orang Asi because of the degazetment of Kuala Lumpur North Forest Reserve. This is said to be in the last uh, urban forest in Selangor a very urban state, and they're going to degazette 97% of this place. And we see urbanites actually in solidarity with uh, Orang Asli who are living there. And also a more powerful pictures coming up from there. Thomas of the term ones of the Kuala Langat North Forest Reserve. So uh, when I look at uh, the topics being discussed here, and they're very interesting, uh, and I wish that there's more stories from there. I was wondering how uh, can researchers like you work with journalists to tell those stories, whether they are about um, human relationship with elephants or um, like what Colin was showing, how they are responsible for their own livelihoods, they are creative, they solve problems uh, and uh, 
they can even be uh, an asset, like what Wong Pui Mei was saying. Uh, their knowledge, their contributions to society, in particular uh, with climate change, how can they, they play a role and be responsible and offer a contribution to our society and to our environment in these times of climate change? So perhaps uh, we can have a, a conversation how to how these stories that researchers are doing can be uh, used uh, as news reports, documentaries, uh, contents, you know, for the media. So th that's all for my presentation tonight. Okay, uh, thanks very much. I think that was a um, appropriate way to end uh, a very interesting talk. So we're gonna move into um, question and answers now. Um, and maybe we can start with uh, questions for, for Jules. Um, so feel free to chime in. And then I'm gonna hand over the microphone to my uh, fellow co-organizer, Tom Kraft, and he is going to be moderating the question and answers after this. So questions for, for uh, Jules to start us off. I just want to say uh, excellent, uh, excellent summary of something that has been going on for a long time. Um, so that's all I want to say. Okay, thank you. Hi, Yvonne here. If, if I may say something, Jules, I think you brought up a very important um, point. Um, the narrative about the Orang Asli needs to be more positive. And uh, like you said, we really need to engage with the media. Like you see from the perspective that I'm doing, the things that they need, they prefer to highlight would be you know, in terms of the infection. But it's not about yeah. that. It's about what we can do because we need to engage with the government with data. But I need mm. them to, to, to see it from a positive perspective. And sometimes this is a bit daunting because I think for the media, um, they may think this may not create sensation. So I, I have really problem with this because, you know, um, like, I mean, generally in, in all topics as well, the negativity of things are more sensational than the positive things. So we really need to work together to, to change this mindset, to have this culture generally, I think in all aspects, to, to highlight the positivity. You see, in terms of health, um, it's not about whether they are, being, they are Orang Asli or they are other communities. Health is universal. It's just that, you know, the, the probably the uh, sometimes even sometimes genetic makeups may predispose them. But I think even we will need to sensitize the government that they are Malaysians. And in terms of health perspective, solutions needs to be targeted, even in any other disease. So it's not just about them being around us. So this is the kind of narrative I think we really need to uh, promote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank yes, you. Yes. Thank you for your presence. Yes, thank you. I think, yeah, I, I definitely agree with you, um, Yvonne. Um, thing is that bad news make <laughs> news. <laughs> um, and uh, more so with regards to the Orang Aslis, because they are so marginalized and neglected. Uh, so when there's a certain uh, crisis or catastrophe, like the batiks dying, suddenly it's big news. So that's the only time I did, oh, they're batiks, actually. I've never heard of batiks before, and it's the first time we've heard about them. Um, so, uh, and also because they live in the interior, we feel that, you know, the center of media, you know, Kuala Lumpur, Penang, you know, we, we don't uh, have that... Uh, the resource, not just resource, and I think the interest actually is to step out of our, of our cities to go a little bit further to actually stay there and um, experience being with them and then finding our stories there, you know, uh, unless there's a crisis, there's a blockade, uh, or an artist are dying, you know. So then our reports are very one dimensional and simplistic. 
and uh, more often than not, not we also use we and I think I represent the media, so we're guilty of using the language of power, uh, where the government is just seen as the ultimate authority. They come to an Orang Asli village and then they pronounce that we will build a road here and we will we will do a plantation there. The government says this authority says, and then when we report on the Orang Asli, they are, the Tok Bating, even though it's the leader of the community, the Tok Bating claims that the land has been deforested or the water has been polluted. Claims, you know, so this language is uh, kind of very insidious uh, that makes the readers see that okay, the the Orang Aslis uh, cannot be trusted. The claim, you know, is contestable. Whereas whatever the government says is said, you know. So these these things are a bit subtle, but uh, it makes the readers very clearly. It just brainwashes you that uh, uh, the Orang Aslis are powerless, they're victims, so say. They're, again, it re reiterates all that uh, dynamics and all that stereotypes. So I think as researchers, you guys have such amazing stories, you know, <laughs> and. Uh, if there, if there can be a way for you to like, uh, I don't know, package the story in some ways. Even the work you do about worms, yeah, if you want, it can be uh, touching. Um, it can be packaged in a very interesting way. Uh, we can have a discussion after this, uh, but uh, definitely the, uh, I see the, the, the issues that you guys have brought up, uh, again, can be packaged in, in uh, just to give a diversity, a diversity of the portrayal of Orang Asi, so that it's not so simplistic and one dimensional. You know? um, that even the diversity of population, um, yes, the health impacts, uh, but also what Orang Asi themselves are doing. I mean, all those years, don't tell me they're not doing anything, you know, except being infected by chaching, you know, I'm sure they must have done something, you know. So we have to have that. Uh, that that different perspective to try to, to to tease out those stories, you know. I like those stories where uh, Orang Aslis are uh, agents of their own, said the self determination, agents of change. Uh, what is their knowledge? We always think they are uneducated, but have we actually talked to them and asked them what is their knowledge? Wealth of knowledge, you know. Yes. I think we at this point need to be educated because we are facing yes. climate change. We are in deep shit now. And uh, the Orang Aslis, I mean, in other countries, in Indonesia and South America, the government has elected the uh, Orang Aslis as ministers of the environment or guardians of it because they realize that we, the urbanized, do not have that knowledge. We need to be educated, you know. <laughs> so then the trope of Orang Asli uneducated must be educated. I think it needs to be, we need to look at ourselves in the mirror, you know, who actually needs to be educated? <laughs> who is the one destroying the world and needs to be, uh, forget our education and re-educated. So there are a lot of, uh, sorry. Mm. Yeah, we need that, to turn the table around and their yeah. indigenous knowledge is so rich. We have not tapped that. It. Even oh, the more patients. Yeah, uh -huh. they, 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 right. they may have their own medication. So we always impose yeah. our own West, you know, our own sort of yeah. knowledge to them. You should ask them, what do you do? You know, when you... and uh, I attended some of the sewangs where five hours, a whole community coming together to heal three people, you know. And then I'm thinking I'm paying a hundred ringgit to see a doctor for five minutes, you know. The whole community is there for the people who are not well and they go through a ritual, they sing, they dance uh, for the well-being of three people in a community. It took five hours, you know. And I asked uh, uh, the shaman, um, I asked him, so when you, you're like a doctor, I said, you actually do healing for people. Do they actually pay you any money? No, no monetary transaction, you know. <laughs> Uh, and it's just a, a different way of uh, healing. And we go to the doctor, they do as a whole community doing it. So I think uh, these are the, again the stories that uh, are not told enough to the media, have not shown enough uh, to see this other side, this rich uh, culture, ed, uh, 
education knowledge, you know, that we could learn from. Yeah, absolutely, Jules. And so on a related point, I'd just like to pivot uh, to a comment that's related that came up in the chat from uh, Reta Rahim, um, mm -hmm. talk, discussing uh, how Orang Asli, in some cases, um, giving the example here of Facebook pages, um, have begun taking over some of the narrative themselves rather than it being portrayed a portrayal of Orang Asli by outsiders. Uh, Reta, would you like to uh, comment briefly about or give us more information about those kind of initiatives? Not sure. Might be muted. Also possible. She says that her mic is not working. Ah, okay. Um, perhaps we can return to that point. Yeah, or, uh, or maybe someone else has knowledge of that who can chime in. Yeah, uh, Colin might be another person who could speak to that. Um, yes, uh, <clears throat> as you know, many of the young Orang Asli today are on to social media. And, uh, and some of these things that come up, no? The word Sakai being used by politicians, by, you know, uh, uh, movie stars, I mean, not movie stars, actors and personalities. And terms like Orang Asli are smelly and dirty. There was one uh, Malay uh, businesswoman who was making a lot of money from sales from Orang Asli. And after making that statement, she had to apologize through the web, you know, to the chat groups. And so there is a lot of uh, content going on among the Orang Asli in Malay, uh, in their respective uh, social media, see? not just Facebook, in WhatsApp groups and, and all kinds of uh, things. So it's actually very interesting to follow that. I think somebody should follow that and, and, and uh, you know, analyze what's happening with it. Because definitely it's a different kind of Orang Asli able to defend themselves and uh, are, are proud to be Orang Asli, not like what it was in the 70s and 80s. Mm. Yes, I think the uh, social media has uh, opened up the um, uh, open up the democratizing the uh, space for media portrayal. And uh, yes, uh, a number of Orang Asis have begun to um, speak up and uh, because it's accessible and it's available. And I think that's a good thing. Although the mainstream media has not moved, but, but now even the social media is, can be more powerful than the mainstream media. Yeah, I think it's quite true. Uh, so, sorry, I can't have my video on because there's a bandwidth limitation. But, but uh, it's, it's, it's really good to actually be able to see this coming out now where Orang Asli themselves, in particular the younger generation, are really voicing out uh, on, on other platforms. And I think it will come to a point where the, the mainstream media is really lagging behind uh, in terms of, of giving them their own voices. I think it's great. There's this empowerment that, that's been happening, I think, in the past few years. And, and I wonder if there are avenues for us to think about partnerships between institutions that are considered more neutral, you know, rather than government agencies or, or um, these, these big um, bodies that want to impose their views on them, you know. So just, just having some thoughts, really. And, and I really like uh, what's been posted in the Good Right or Asli with Rita, and we've had webinars that, that have been on Facebook, where the Orang Asli themselves are actually organizing them and talking to issues. It's, it's really been great um, to, to see all this, this activity happening. That, that's, a great, that's a great point, Maud. Um, does anyone else want to jump in? Um, you know, we had a lot of speakers today. So if, if anyone has any questions that they wanted to ask uh, throughout, otherwise I'll raise some that came up in the chats. But if anyone would like to speak up for any of our speakers, please go ahead. Um, Tom? Yes, ma'am. Can I just, yeah, I just wanted to add something on what Jules was saying about representation and language. And, uh, just wanted to make a point about the importance of terminology. Uh, Colin said earlier that you know, they didn't flee into the forest and treated 
Uh, last week, someone said in the comments, mentioned something about roaming areas of Kawasan Rayao. And uh, we had this discussion during the Penier State Park Management Plan workshop, where I felt that Kawasan Rayao roaming area does not do Orang Asli justice. Uh, because they are clearly not roaming. Roaming means wandering about aimlessly and they are not doing that. So for the state park, um, I suggested an alternative term called Territories of Life, which is used by the ICCA consortium. Uh, and in Malay, it could be Kawasan Penghidupan. So this is something that's a bit more neutral when it comes to talking to governments because you know, Tana Ada and all make them all panicky and defensive. So um, I think that's quite a neutral term which also reflects uh, our Asi relationship with their land rather than booming area. Um, also, I wanted to add that Kirk has left, but I wanted to say that um, you know, the presence of anthropologists in communities since the 1970s, I think it made an impact on how they view themselves. It's like a source of pride that someone from this white man from far away wants to come and learn from us. And they tell me that about Tanjong, who was uh, Kirk Endicott's chikgu, they tell me things that Endicott told them from before and go on and on about Ayah. So, uh, so I think that there's value in the work that you do. And I, I learned a lot from Sakko's writings and Kirk's writings also about the Bate um, and how you how you view Orang Asli, yeah. I, I think everyone needs to learn to see them in the way that, that anthropologists see Orang Asli. And, then, and that would be one of the key um, leverage points, changing mindset in this system. So, yeah. so well, we have, we have a long way to go, but you know, it, it's change starts with us. Yes, good point, May. Sorry, can I just ask, I'm reading the, the chat and, and we have Zining here, Zining, um, telling us about these Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact, publish a best practice guide for media practitioners for reporting on Indigenous peoples. I'm, I'm wondering, Zining, whether or not some of our Malaysian Orang Asli uh, were involved in this practical guide. Can you talk us through that very briefly? Uh, hi, uh, Zening here. Uh, no, it was um, uh, Malaysia was not involved in the publication, but um, I think it's generic enough, and I think um, they list a guidelines of terminologies, which I think it is relevant for this region. Um, Jaringan orang asal se Malaysia Joas also translated a Malay version, so I'll drop it in the chat box for your reference. Thank you. Jules, are you aware of this? No, no way. I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, it, it looks interesting. Thank you. Thanks. Actually, there are many publications by from the Asian News People's Pack on various aspects, including free fire informed consent and human rights defenders, not rights. The, mm -hmm. the book on the manual on human rights defenders, indigenous human rights defenders, has just been translated to Malay and we hope to get it published soon. But you can get an online copy if you if you ask me, if you want. Excellent. Thanks, Colin. Okay, I'd, I'd like to um, raise a point that came up earlier in the comments. Um, it's been sort of a, a theme throughout. Is, uh, is, is Hubert Thong still here? Uh, if, if so, I'd, I'd like to ask him to speak a bit more about, he, he mentioned that Kempung Sungai Hulu in uh, near Lungang did pull roots and went back to the jungle during the MCO and have remained there today. Um, this is something we heard a bit about last time. Um, Hubert, would, could you elaborate on that, um, that movement that you've seen as a result of the MCO? Okay, uh, Kampung Ulu Lavin Selatan is a village that we've been helping with uh, food aid and medication. And then uh, in March, in March uh, when they started locking down the place, they asked us for extra food because uh, many, many places in, in the world were already starting to lock down. So they asked us for extra food so that they could go to the jungle to wait it up. 
So I was invited to go along with them to stop, supposedly to keep me safe. So when I went there after the lockdowns, the village wasn't there anymore. Uh, after a couple of months uh, back in August, I did a hike. I found them about six kilometers in the jungle. And they've been staying there ever since. I think uh, they are doing very well because the river is pristine. There are animals and there are fish in that river. So I think uh, to shift from that government given place, the government built them brick houses. To shift from that back into the jungle, they seem to be thriving now. That's it. And and those are uh, those are timiars, is that right? Yeah, they are timiars. Yeah. Um, during the NCO, a few villages did go back first to retreat and then to make a permanent settlement. But the trend of going back to the uh, back to roots, those are the original villages started really quite long ago in 2011, 2010, several villages. In fact, uh, the Chakwa considers them as Kawasawat, Kampong Tambahan or Sepehan. Additional villages or fringe or what breakaway villages. And according to their account, there's not Kampong Tambahan. Yeah, Kampong Tambahan. There are 126 such villages, but according to our, our numbers, at least 250. Villages that have broken away or gone back to roots, not just for the MCO, but ever since 2010, 2009, and so on. And, and are those spread around the country, or are those concentrated in specific areas, uh, certain ethno-linguistic mainly, groups? Mainly Perak Pahang, but also in, uh, in, in other areas in the south. Interesting. I, I think they, uh, it started way before that, Colin, uh, when I was living in Kuala Kubu Baru, Kampung Perta Azib Garachi, they split into two. And the, 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 the new community was in a much better place for themselves. I don't know about now, but back then. So Kampung Grachi and Pertang, they were resettled. Or, well, Grachi was relocated because of the dams, language dam. Uh, Pertang was not resettled, but their land was taken, but the, the traditional lands and estates and so on remained intact no? after the protest. So they were not really uh, going back to the roots, but they were there all the time but in a bigger area. This, and this one is, you were resettled by the government in the recruitment scheme you know, 30, 20 years ago. And after, after that number of years, you find that you cannot survive or you know, it just, there's too much control. You, you go back to the original area and, uh, and start all over again. The important thing, the most important thing, they, of course they say they want to defend their, the land, protect their, their, their roots of their culture and so on. But the top, important thing is autonomy. They want autonomy, full control of their lives and the territories they, they reside in. Uh, I'll send you the link to the Google, uh, uh, what do you call it? Google, Google Voyager uh, program on uh, Back to Roots for the Tamiya. And you can watch the, look at the videos and the stories, the pictures, then you get an idea of what's, why this is happening. Well, I think um, the brick houses are much maligned, but uh, we also talked about how orang are not homogenous. And I can say that when you're in the middle of a monsoon and it's raining cats and dogs every day, sometimes a brick house is appreciated. And there are also some bate who are quite happy to live in the brick houses because it's, it's, it's tough. It's, it's really difficult to move around, you know, carry all your stuff in the back and a child in front. Um, yeah, and so I think that's the perspective that's worth mentioning also. And just one uh, quick follow-up, Colin, are the, when people tr move uh, from the regroupment settlements, do they typically not have any sort of official rights to the, to the land that they, they end up settling on elsewhere? Yeah, that, that's where all the disputes are happening now, is it? Where two things happen. One, when you, when you go back to your roots, you know, when you leave the resettlement scheme, uh, there'll be attempts by Jaqua to ask you to sign uh, letters of indemnity that you have left the settlement and therefore no, more, no longer entitled to your allotted land or houses or whatever, you know, and benefits on that scheme. And uh, or um, the areas are sometimes recognized and sometimes not recognized. When I say recognized means uh, no, no official recognition, but they allow you to happen there. And a good indication of re uh, recognition is that the health department goes in, the other services go in, you know. So like the left pictures I showed just now, that, that was a breakaway village, or not already a breakaway, it was an original village. They were resettled in Kema and came back again, no? But the health department goes in, so the health department somehow doesn't really bother about whether it's a registered village or not registered village, no? But for, for Jaqua, 
it's a big thing because if it's a registered village, then they are obliged to provide all the infrastructure facilities and help and appoint a button and pay the fee, uh, allowance and so on. But uh, at the same time, the government doesn't want to recognize these settlements because those lands are the new frontier for the government. The, those lands are lands which they want. So that's where the, the big conflict happening there in these areas. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'd like to open up the floor again. Does anyone else want to chime in with a, a question for any of our speakers? Colin, um, you know, it, it's also to do with, with different state governments, isn't it, as to how these communities are treated and what sort of incentives they are given by the various states. Do, do you think uh, what's happening with the Royal Balloon State Park and the uh, Negrito communities there uh, is a good thing where they're encouraging to, them to develop fly fishing and some of these things that Shah Reza and, and his rangers do. Is, is that, do you think it's something good that can, what, what's your view on those initiatives and the efforts they've put in so far? Because I, I follow some of the FB posts and it seems to be something that he, that, that seems to be empowering and also goes with, you know, ecotourism and things like that. What, what are your thoughts on that? So um, we, the Orang Asli, unfortunately, have to deal with little Napoleons, you know, people at the local level, district level, who, take, who think that they're gods, you know. If you want the IC, you have to convert to Islam before you can get registered. Shah, in Bulum area, Shah Reza, the head of the uh, state, Sabah State, uh, no, Sabah, uh, Perak State Parks. Bulum State Park, yeah. But, um, uh, no, I think it's Perak State Park in Balloon area in charge. Uh, he's, the, he's, he's an exceptional case. He has heart for the Orangasi. He came from the environmental uh, conservation movement. And he has good friends like Kamal, who is here in this group. We can talk better about him. But they have positive views. His vision for the Orangasi there is that in, in a number of years, 10 years, 12 years, no, there will be educated Orangasi who can run the park themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. That kind of a vision he has. But mind yeah. you, Royal Balloon, and uh, 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 what do you call it, the, the forest reserve next to it, the Tumungo Dam and Banun, RS, mm -hmm. RPS Banun. This was the, one of the early resettlement programs, you know, 1977, they started building the Tumungo Dam and then RPS Banun was, was, uh, was, was brought up. People were asked to resettle there. Until yeah. today, many of the promises, development, agriculture, even electricity is not, has not been provided. So therefore, all those around us live from, from the Bulum area, upper part of the East West Highway, who were resettled at Bandung, were forced to go back to, the, to these original areas where they are now. And the government there, at least the state park, has recognized that they have a right to stay there. So that's okay. good. But it's not, it's not the case for all the Orang Asli areas. Indeed, thank you. So Para is not doing too badly, is there? Is there uh, oh, Para is doing very badly. Yes, it only certain badly. bits are, are all right, is it? No, no, no. Para is doing very badly. Because we have a, a chief minister there who does not believe in uh, the, the, what do you call it, the, um, the presence or the, what do you call it, the right of Orang Asli to the traditional land, Tanah Adat. He says there's no such thing as Tanah Adat native uh, title land in Perak because there's nothing in it in the constitution. There's nothing in it in the state laws. No? Even though there was a case uh, taken up in uh, Kampung Center in Bido where the Orang mm -hmm. Asli won rights to the customary lands, and the government yeah. was, the government was asked to uh, gazette five thousand acres, so that kind of argument from Perak is very damaging because because of this particular chief minister. I hope he goes out very soon because he's destroying the environment and he's the cause behind all the logging that is happening there, including uh, environmental damage done to other areas. So, uh, top guys are all the same in all the states. The, the little Napoleons are made dangerous in some areas. We got good guys like Shah in certain places, and that's mm -hmm. why we need all of these kind of people. Okay, thanks. This might be a good time to address an earlier question that came from ASEAN, or, or rather a, a, a comment from ASEAN, pointing out that um, with regards to Jakowa and I, the situation in Kuala Coast specifically, um, mentioned that J Jacko informed that they did hold discussions with the uh, FGV Holdings Burhad to make the uh, people living in Qualico participants in the farming scheme, uh, given that their land was being used for the oil palm there. Uh, but at the end of the day, that the FGV did not 
agree to this. And so nothing developed from there. ASEAN, would you like to comment further on that, um, on that point? Sorry, my English not good lah. So better, uh, I I type. Uh, okay. Uh, we uh at Soha Cup always uh the uh get uh issue oral asli. Uh, example uh education, land right, and uh, uh healthy also lah. So uh can I uh uh. Can I uh uh one uh, get uh, my help with uh with my friend at Sohakam also? Can Tanaim uh, Tanaim because my my language not good. Okay, can Tanaim? Yes. Hello, Tanaim. Boleh tolong oh, yes. Esin? Yeah. Ah, boleh, okay. boleh. Okay, okay. Um, explain, explain yang, yang pasal apa tu? Pasal kita ada bukan meeting dengan apa agensi-agensi ni. Contohlah, kita pernah buat uh, uh, satu kes di... Uh, okay, saya cakap dalam bahasa Melayu dulu and then kawan saya akan cakap dalam bahasa Inggeris ya. Minta maaf sebab bahasa saya agak ni. Okay, kita pernah uh, ada dapat satu kes di uh, di negeri sembilan. Okay, kita dah buat, uh, kita dah buat perbincangan bersama uh, agensi kerajaan dan agensi-agensi uh, tersebut seperti pejabat tanah, pejabat uh, jabatan alam sekitar, jakwa, uh, daer uh, majlis daerah sekali lah. Uh, dan kita juga telah buat uh, apa perbincangan bersama pihak luar yang nak buat uh, inquiry dengan uh, di tempat kawasan orang asli. Bila kita pergi dekat kawasan tu, memang sangat berhampiran dengan kawasan rumah orang asli. And then bila kita dapati, bila kita pergi dekat semua agensi, dia main tolak-tolak. Okay, agensi ni ke sini, agensi ni ke sini. Uh, Jakwa tolak ke Jabatan Alam Sekitar. Jabatan Alam Sekitar akan tolak ke PTD, eh, PTG. And then PTG akan tolak ke ke Jabatan, uh, ke, jabatan uh, ke Majlis Daerah. Dia main tolak macam sepak bola lah. Okay, and then bila kita dapati rupa-rupanya, Uh, ini bukan saya nak salahkan Jakwa uh, uh, atau sebagainya lah. Masalahnya uh, sekarang ni Jakwa yang memberikan uh, apa, uh, kebenaran untuk, untuk orang asli di situ dan orang asli dekat situ dia dia tak tahu pun yang kebenaran tu di, uh, kebenaran untuk membuat uh, apa orang cakap uh, uh, inquiry tu. Uh, apa orang cakap kebenaran itu tak dibuat oleh komuniti orang asli. Okey, Tak Naim, tolong translate. Okey. So, um, so uh, we uh, in Swakam had, had actually uh, conducted um, uh, an, investig an investigation into a case uh, in uh, Negeri Sembilan. So um, we uh, went into a discussion uh, discussions uh, with uh, agencies uh, such as the land office, uh, the environmental department, and then the district office and also uh, 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 the company involved in the quarry. Um, and then uh, we uh, find out uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, the area chosen by the company was uh, really close to the, um, uh, to the village of uh, Orang Asli. So, uh, so uh, we tried to get, um, we, uh, we tried to get um, a response from the agencies and it seems like uh, they are like, uh, they are uh, uh, they, uh, they are uh, kicking kicking the issue to uh, to uh, to each other. I, I mean, I mean, uh, they don't give a specific uh, 
specific answer or uh, they don't give uh, us uh, any specific agency that we could uh, we could deal with so um uh, and then and then later we uh, we also find out uh, from jaqua uh, uh, we also find out from the uh, as in from the the orang asli community uh, themselves eh? ah ya yeah. sebab orang asli dia tak tahu yang uh, apa keputusan tu dibuat oleh jaqua dan uh, apa hmm. cakap maksudnya Uh, Jakwa telah uh, membagi kebenaran kepada pihak luar tu untuk membuat kuiri tu di kawasan orang asli tanpa mm-hmm. tanpa orang asli tahulah benda tu. I see. So uh, uh, later we find out from the the orang asli community uh, that uh, Jakwa actually uh, uh, gives uh, give permission to the to to the company to uh, to go on with the uh, with the uh, uh, with the uh, quarry uh, without any consultation with the with the community themselves so uh, it, it means that uh, they uh, the, the community were uh, the, the communities uh, were excluded from uh, 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 from the consultation there is no consultation uh, made uh, with regard to the uh, or asli community themselves Mean, uh, mean, means that uh, means that uh, only only Jaqua uh, deals uh, with the uh, with the company. Uh, can I add uh, the case which Asian brought up just now is in Negeri Sembilan, involving the quarry which is going on for the last since the 1990s. No, uh, that issue is a big issue because it's also Vision Valley taking up all the Orangasi lands in Negeri Sembilan. But the original question from Tom Craft was the FGV project. Uh, discussions with FG Felda Global Ventures in the Kuala Ko area, and yes, there was when Julie became uh, Director General of Jaqua last year, and when the Kuala Ko deaths happened, his suggestion was why does Felda need to take so much land? Give some of the give uh, a portion some of the 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 Felda scheme to for the needs of the Orang Asli, so income from that scheme can go towards helping the Orang Asli, the Batik there in in various forms, isn't it? So, like I told you just now uh, in the presentation, 600 acres were were applied for, and uh, they only got 14 acres. So, Felda is another land grabber, and not only is it a land grabber for the for the for the population, it's also played out its own people, the Malays generally, you know, the settlers. Many of them have uh, lost out on the on the resettlement and uh, uh, agricultural development schemes, just like the Orang Asli. Um, can I add on to that? Um, so, Felda Aring, the Pulau and the Blast 10 and 11, it, ex- it doesn't really extend up to the village. The oil palm plantations immediately surrounding the village have been given up to smallholder plantations. Um, yeah, and I don't know why Kuala Kuala people don't get any dividends and all that from Felda. Uh, while in the Tengganu side, the Sumat Gari and Kapung Sumat Baru actually received dividends from the Felkra oil palm plantations. Um, and then I've um, met with Felda people, I think they are RSPO officer once, and uh, they said that they offer Kolako people jobs and Kolako didn't want. And then when I asked Kolako people, they said they want to work, but then uh, Felda didn't offer jobs. And I think Aya mentioned in her presentation earlier that um, Batik are not fond of long-term contract jobs. Uh, and I think Maybe Tako or someone else wrote about Bate in Pahang who didn't want to work in oil palm plantations because it's it's boring, it's difficult, you know, it's, yeah, and so they prefer to revert back to hunting and gathering. And I see that interestingly in Kampung Sungai Boroa as well in Tanganyu. That Kampung is even more accessible in Bolako. So a whole host of development projects have been have been done there and pretty well documented by Ramli Abdullah that a lot of them failed. And until now, they're still hunting and gathering. And interestingly, because they have cars and motorbikes, they just hunt and gather over a wider area. They go to Basu, they go to Dungun for day trips, uh, and, and but they still go to you know, their traditional areas, Sungai Chaching, Sungai Terengai. Yeah, so it could also be you know, community preference. Uh, I, I think. Uh, sorry, oh yeah. Go ahead, Tom. 
Okay, I, I just got a WhatsApp uh, chat yesterday uh, from Bate of Arin Lima. Uh, he uh, worked for plantation and got gaji and send a ha happy face. <laughs> but uh, Kuanako people, they they have a uh, guta, uh, rubber uh, trees and work uh, collect the gutta and sell it, but it's not a uh, systematic uh, way of working. And still like to, uh, how can I say, foraging better than work for plantation. Yeah, I, I, think think it, it, I think they still have the option because it's, it's still Tamanagara that you know, our plant is not going to. Sorry. I don't. I don't think the batik uh, in Pahang are against all palm uh, planting, but most of them, if you ask them to compare different kinds of work, uh, they would not like the boredom of it, of that kind of work. There are some who are engaged in in all palm plantations, uh, but I think only on a, a daily basis. They're not. But they, they do get dividends. Uh, I don't know through through Jacoa, is it Colin? So they, they do get an income from all palm. Hey, hey, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, here, uh, from Management Ecology of Malaysian Elephants. I just like to share my perspective from uh, working in community from the human elephant conflict angle. So, um, yes, the indigenous community, they, they want to be independent, they want to, you know, um, earn their own living, so, and they turn to uh, crops like rubber, oil palm, but these crops are also uh, targeted, yeah, for elephants, and hence, this causes a lot of conflict between the community with elephants. So, that is my dilemma on how can we help to um, reduce the tension and how do we promote coexistence, create a landscape where the community and, and wild elephants can live together. Um, because often uh, important forests for the community are also the last bastion uh, for wildlife. Yeah. So I feel there is a, a great need uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure, sure I'm right or not. Uh, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But I feel there is a great need to provide this community with a viable livelihood that doesn't require them to um, cut down uh, the forest and plant um, crops, which cause attract elephants and cause conflict because that is a vicious circle, I feel. And it sounds like um, the community still depend on the forest for a lot of resources. So I'm, I'm thinking, how can we align all this? Uh, listening to the talk today, you know, ranging from diseases um, to coexistence to creating agency for the community, giving them the sense of self pride. Yeah. So um, are, are, are we creating jobs that are suitable for the community? Yeah, I'd like to hear what, what the panelists think about this. Would anyone like to speak to this uh, tough question? Seems like if uh, if Tech Quinn is is here, he he might be qualified. Uh, May, you might also have some thoughts. Right. Um, um, thanks. Sorry, take me enjoy. Yeah. Thanks, Ipin, for giving me such a tough question. Yeah, I, one thing I would say that I didn't mention in my talk is that Malaysia is now a very urbanized country. And so um, the wealth is also concentrated in urban areas. And so that actually does give us an advantage when it comes to conservation, in that the rich people in the urban areas can actually subsidize through their taxes initiatives of the federal government that uh, would uh, benefit the people 
like the Orang Asli, who face the brunt of wildlife conflict and problems of living in rural areas. And so that, I think, really has to be one aspect of the solution is some way, uh, what in some way that um, people who live in cities, who like the idea of having wildlife, you know, that nature lovers and so on, um, can actually uh, um, channel some funds. And it, it's, uh, it'll be, it's, a, it's somewhat controversial, but I think it, perhaps some kind of um, scheme of where the people who suffer from uh, conflict would get some kind of compensation maybe cash or maybe some other form of compensation. Now, I didn't have a chance really to look at that in my PhD, but I, I think that might be a solution. Um, I can add a bit to that also. Uh, Yipin, have you ever asked them how they think, what they think the solution could be? Uh, and if do they like really want to farm knowing that elephants are going to come and destroy the crops or is there something else that they, they want to do or what have they been doing all along? Um, because in, in Sri Lanka, where that small island has got five to 6,000 elephants, comparatively we've got about 1,000 plus in Peninsula Malaysia, there's a long history of human elephant conflict. Um, but what researchers found was that um, there were, there were Traditionally, they knew how to deal with that. They knew where the elephant's migratory path was. They knew not to open farms along those paths. Uh, these are traditional societies. But it was when urbanization happened and modernization happened, when um, local governance systems were replaced by top-down administrative people, uh, it was then that you know, they started opening up farms everywhere and that caused a lot of uh, human elephant conflict. So I'm not sure if, you know, digging into the existing knowledge would help in, in this respect. But yeah, it's a, yeah. It's a difficult negotiation. Yeah, yes, yes me. Um, um, okay, okay. Uh, I guess uh, what I meant uh, is more to the community and, and living deep in the forest um, where they yeah, are surrounded by forests and they are experiencing conflict uh, with elephants there. Yes, uh, I looked at HEC issues across Peninsula Malaysia and some areas um, that require different solutions, but um, areas where you know the communities are staying deep in the forest, um, I feel, I feel the, the best, best way to help them withstand human elephant conflict is to provide them with an alternative source of income so they don't have to depend on uh, their farms. Yeah. Um, and of course, uh, in, in, in Para, we've seen uh, efforts, uh, reforestation efforts where you know, the community helped to gather the seedlings, grow the, the trees, and then sell them uh, for some income. So they are this type of um, activities coming up, but I feel that it is not sufficient. It is not enough. Um, uh, and I think getting communities involved in enforcement, uh, wildlife enforcement, uh, helps them yeah, um, uh, get, get a uh, stable income. And when they help NGOs to do research, they get you know uh, income at least. Uh, uh, for for me, we provide a monthly salary that is they will they they will get uh, even though it's COVID nineteen they cannot go to the forest but they will still get uh, a salary. So um, uh, yeah, I, I'm thinking you know opportunities like that may help, but is there more that can can we can do? Yiping, can I just ask uh, the kind of jobs that you mentioned just now, like? guarding the forest and all that that NGOs are doing. What happens when the money runs out? Yes, Karmal, that is the part of the challenge, I feel. That's why I, uh, uh, I, you know, 
for, for NGOs uh, and also research organizations like me, uh, Minim is tied with the university, but we still depend on donors, yeah, uh, raising funds to support our uh, activities. And this type of income are not stable. And hence, you know, uh, sometimes if you have a lot of research, you hire a lot of people, then, you know, once uh, the research is reduced, you might uh, shrunk to uh, just to the core, core three or four person. Uh, okay, okay, if, uh, okay, yeah. okay. So, so the money runs out. There's one thing you just mentioned about budget, about grants and all. But what happens if the government decides to have a different policy to the land use? Wouldn't, wouldn't like what Colin was trying to say about recognition of right and autonomy be the foundation we should be talking about? A lot of the places now that people are fighting for conservation on the central forest pine are done by orang asli. Your, your, your termias in Gua Musang. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so isn't it oh, better to ground conservation in recognition of land rights? No, no I, I feel, feel that, that it, it should complement. I don't think it is... It uh, we we need, need to be at the opposite end, end of the... You're absolutely right. Yeah. It should complement, but it should start with a recognition of, of rights. That's, that's where I see the gap is like I'm giving employment is simply giving a job, but it's not recognition of rights to land or, or whatever they call it, you know, and I think this is where the debate needs to, to engage with. I, I, remember, I forgot the name of that guy that Ahimsa brought over, but he was fantastic. Um, professor, what was it? Huh? The guy from Florida uh, and how he spoke about, about indigenous land and conservation. I think that's the kind of conversation we need to bring here. And actually, um, if I, 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 I guess, Kama, 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 what, what, what my point is, uh, the reason why I harped on livelihood is because that is the immediate concern on their mind. They, they need money to buy food, they need money you know, uh, for their family. So hence, I, I latch on to that first. It doesn't mean that I don't agree with, with you know, land rights and all. But I, I feel uh, sometimes, yes, I, I'm, I'm a conservationist, so sometimes I feel that uh, we are being pitted against, um, you know, uh, indigenous community societies, but when we should be working together. I don't think there should be a conflict between us because we are working towards the same goal. We, are, we want to conserve the forest. We want to protect, you know, the heritage. Yeah, the heritage includes biodiversity and also includes the way of life for the indigenous communities. And, uh, and the conservation society is helping to empower the indigenous community, you know, giving them um, by working together. Uh, yeah, I have to admit, you know, for our research, we depend a lot on our uh, indigenous staff, yeah, to contribute their knowledge in order to help us collect the data and all. So. I, I think this is a symbiosis that we need to look at, but it's just, I feel that the narrative that goes out every time is very isolated, is very separate. Wildlife conservation one side, indigenous community one side, uh, and just now health it is totally, you know, in, in another angle. So my, my question is how do we unite these three things in order to highlight the issue to the government, present a stronger case to the government that we should protect the forest, we should govern the forest, you know, uh, to prevent diseases, to, to empower the community, you know, along that lines, how do we unite these narratives? Yeah, and um, I just want to jump in and say, Kamal, I think your, your question raises an interesting parallel with healthcare as well. Um, we'll, we'll hear from D Dr. Stephen Chow next week, who, who recently left the meeting today, but um, the, the notion of providing health in NGOs or organizations providing healthcare on sort of a short term grant funded type of basis, and then sometimes that money, it doesn't last. So when those organizations leave, it can often leave a vacuum in terms of the the care that's available, which is clearly why it's so important that the, the government be involved in these sort of long-term initiatives. Um, we're, we're running short on time. I do just wanna uh, go to have one question to sort of bring our themes together here today. Um, for Aya that came up earlier in, in the chat, uh, this question came from Sumatra. And uh, I think it's a good way for us to finish here today because Sumatra is asking, about how people in the Kuala, the, the Kempung Kuala Co community prefer to access healthcare services 
and whether or not people there uh, trust the medical services that are provided by the government organization. Uh, Sumatra, are you still with us to, um, uh, to elaborate on this question or otherwise, Aya, we can hear directly your, your answer to that. Um, no, I'm good. Um, I'd just like to hear from Aya because we're short of time. Thank you. Thank you, Sumatra. Uh, the healthcare people, they do not, uh, I think they can visit the camping site by using a uh, plantation road or logging road. And if they come to, uh, they, they come near to the camping site, they will, uh, you know, take the medication care. So, and, uh, and for the, uh, after the uh, last week, uh, last year's tragedy, they are now willing to, to trust the doctors and nurses than before. Is that enough? <laughs> uh, I can add on also. Um, so Aya told me uh, last time, Aya, you mentioned that you started bringing them to Aring Satu to the clinic. Uh, and then after that, they got more used to going there and started going there themselves, right? Um, so I have got two stories to share about healthcare, if I may. Uh, one is that recently I went there and then this little boy, he had very bad case of senior. Um, the scaly skin, Tinia uh, in Jakarta, and also he had like mucus running down his nose. And this boy, I noticed that he always has mucus running down his nose. And Dr. Chow told me that means he has an upper respiratory tract infection. So I asked his granny, can I bring him? Uh, he's an orphan. Unfortunately, his mom died in the tragedy last year and his dad is washed away. So I asked his granny, can we bring him to the clinic? And she said, yes. So this granny is very open to doctors and going to hospitals and all that. So I brought him to the clinic. Uh, he got checked over. He got a blood test done quite well. We waited very long. Uh, then doctor found out that he's severely anemic and wanted to admit him. Then I asked granny, can we admit him? And she said, uh, not now because she didn't bring her clothes, but she was willing to... to um, Go with him if Japa can arrange for someone to go into the village to pick him up later. So I said, okay, uh, that's fine. So doctor gave him like a big bottle of um, antifungal shampoo, uh, some vitamins, and then we went back to the village. And then later I followed up with uh, a Jaqua health officer. Uh, and then he said, oh, the RN Satu doctor didn't tell him anything. So, but then he made some arrangements and then called up Granny's son. So he has a phone. Uh, and then, but then when Jaqua called up Granny's son, he said, oh no, the boy is fine. And then, so Jaqua cannot do anything because the boy is fine. And then the next time I went to the village, I wanted to bring him again just to check out, you know, he had finished his meds, his skin looked better. Uh, but then the next time I wanted to bring him there, then he had gone and his father into the forest, so couldn't check up on him. Uh, so yeah, there are... I, I don't know what to call this, structural issues or uh, situational problems, I don't know. Uh, and then another issue was um, this girl who had some kind of transplant. Uh, I, I don't know what, but she was blind and then she had a transplant and then she could see a bit. But she needed to go back to hospital Gombak for follow-up. And it would take a long time because she needed to see multiple specialists and all that. Uh, and then Jaka went again and again to the village, but they were away in the forest. And then finally, when they were in the forest, her dad refused to let her go. Her mom, so this is a woman who had been married, so she's not that young. You know? she's, she's a young woman, but she's not a child. Her mom was willing to go to Gomba. She said, oh yeah, I prefer Gomba to Guamusan because Gomba River, you know? Um, and her mom was willing to go with the, child, the girl, the woman. But the father refused for unknown reasons. And, and then I thought, you know, maybe it's because they didn't want to be out of touch. So I was like, well, you want me to lend her a phone? Then you can keep in touch with your credit card and all that. And he just gave excuse after excuse. Uh, whenever I suggested a solution, he would give another excuse. Yeah, so un until now, she hasn't gone for a checkup. And um, the Jaqua health official doesn't want to force. Uh, and so she's likely to go blind again. 
So yeah, it really much, very much depends on the individual and circumstances. I, I, I just want to uh, add one thing. Uh, if if the medical practitioner won't or uh, but it of Kalako to stay in a hospital, it's better to ask during the rainy season. Yeah, so um well, so these are very important discussions. I'm actually glad that we got to some of this because it really gets into the complexities involved uh, to, to questions there aren't really easy answers to about balancing people, the environment, as well as, as things like health and um, livelihoods. So I, I just want to say thank you again to all of our, our speakers today. Um, since we're a bit over time, we're, we're going to call it quits. But um, just a reminder to everyone that we will be meeting again this time next week. We have another fantastic lineup of speakers, uh, mainly people directly involved in the provisioning of healthcare, uh, including some folks that a lot of people probably know, like Dr. Zandis and Stephen Chow. Um, so uh, I look forward to seeing you all next time. And if you know other people who might like to attend, feel free to uh, share the, share the uh, link with them. And uh, hopefully I'll see you all again next week. So thank you again, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care.